Good morning. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We are live online. All right. I'm still catching my breath from trying to get to the city when it's raining. It's like, it becomes very difficult for some reason. Uh, good morning from Washington, D.C., and a warm welcome to our distinguished guest. And for those of you tuning in um, from places near and far, my name is Lauren Reese, and together with my Wilson Center colleagues and our partners at NOAA, UCAR and the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership, it's my privilege to welcome you to today's discussion. For those of you joining the Wilson Center for the first time, I'll say a quick word about us. The Wilson Center is a think tank based in DC. It is the living memorial to President Wilson, who was the only president to have a PhD. So our congressional mandate is to bring together the world of policy, practice, and research. Programs at the Wilson Center are regionally and topically focused. So we, have, can we cover every corner of the planet and today's most pressing issues. The program I direct, the Environmental Change and Security Program, or ECSP, is focused on connecting the intersection of environment, population, and security to foreign policy and international development. For nearly 30 years now, ECSP has worked with an incredible network of scholars, practitioners, and policymakers, many of whom are here in this room, uh, to bring traditional notions of security up to date, including the role that the environment and natural resources play in conflict, political instability, and in building peace. Water is a big piece of this evolving equation. Not only are our food and energy systems tied to water, but so are trade and transport, human and ecosystem health. Water flows through the relationship between a government and its people. When the state fails to provide clean water and safe water to shore up resilience to flooding and droughts, trust in the state is eroded and where trust between citizens and their government is eroded, instability can grow. As our understanding of risk evolves, so must our responses. Climate-related disruptions, many of which are experienced through water, are increasingly interacting with drivers of insecurity. And we need more effective ways of assessing risk and producing more accurate predictive information. This is where we wanted to start this Water at Wilson series, with a focus on new tools for anticipating, preventing, and responding to water and climate-related conflict. You're going to hear about two such tools today, one from our friends at the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership, and another from a project that the Wilson Center has been uh, leading in partnership with NOAA and UCAR. We originally conceived of this event as a, as a full-day conference on water, but then two things became clear. The first being that our tension spans are not what they were before COVID, especially when it comes to online engagement. And second, a day-long discussion on water is still just a drop in the bucket when it comes to covering an issue that touches on so much of our daily lives. So instead, today is the kickoff to our Water at Wilson series of events. The series will cover a broad range of topics with the goal of asking the right questions, spotlighting new research, surfacing solutions, and helping decision makers to better understand the connections between water and public policy. Some of the events we're, we're uh, putting together include a look at the impact of renewable, the renewable energy transition on water resources, emerging trends in water and security, the future of dams in a drought-stricken world, water's role in trade, the future of water disputes in the United States, and of course, some of the, some of the classics, the connections between water and food and agriculture, and the future of water cooperation. Water has been at the heart of ECSP since its earliest days when former director Jeff DeBelco and his colleagues began looking at water's connection to conflict and peace. We're thrilled to be continuing this legacy and welcome the engagement of our many partners and colleagues working in this space. I want to take a minute to define who I'm talking about when I say we. I have uh, 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 four amazing colleagues in ECSP. It is truly a team effort with Amanda King, Claire Doyle, Harriet Taberner and Abby Anderson, um, two of whom you'll see floating around here, and I hope you'll say hi. Um, they work very hard uh, to make all of this happen. I also want to thank our top tier AV team there in the back, and our external relations team, and our incredible fellows and scholars, two of whom um, are helping to guide today's discussions. Now, there are a fair number of moving parts with today's event, and we're still getting our sea legs when it comes to hybrid events. So I want to thank you in advance for your patience as we work through the agenda. We have speakers joining us from the Netherlands, from Iraq, and Pakistan. There will be an opportunity for Q&A during the panel discussion. And for those of you watching online, I hope that you'll take a minute to in, um, use the box below the video that's streaming to, to send us your questions. 
We're very pleased to welcome the Honorable Dr. Richard Spinrad for opening remarks. I'm going to take a quick minute first, though, to introduce Alyssa Offit, who, following Dr. Spinrad's remarks, will kick off the launch of the Water, Peace, and Security Partnerships tool. Alyssa is the Global Capacity Development Lead of WPS and a doctoral candidate at the IHE Delft Institute of Water Education. She specializes in water quality diplomacy and holds master's degrees in water cooperation and diplomacy and, envi and, and environmental and water resources engineering. It's been a real pleasure working with Alyssa, Susanna Schmeyer, and the whole WPS team on today's event, and the brain power that's gone into this tool that they've developed is really, um, really something special. And now, it's my privilege to introduce the Honorable Dr. Richard Spinrad for opening remarks. Dr. Spinrad is the Under Secretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere and Administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. He brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to his position at NOAA, where he is responsible for the strategic direction and oversight of the agency. He's had an incredibly distinguished career spanning service in the U.S. government and leadership positions at a number of universities, including Oregon State University, where he was a vice president for research. Dr. Spinrad was NOAA's chief scientist under President Obama and has held leadership positions at the U.S. Office of Naval Research and Oceanographer of the Navy, where he was awarded the Distinguished Civilian Service Award. He brings an important combination of research and practical application of the products and services that NOAA provides, in an era where information in the form of daily weather forecasts, severe storm warnings, or climate monitoring can mean the difference between risking one's life or building a resilient future, NOAA keeps the U.S. on the cutting edge of being able to monitor global climate and weather and helping to shape better international oceans, climate, fisheries, space, and weather policies. We're deeply appreciative of NOAA's partnership and Dr. Spinrad's leadership, and it's a pleasure to welcome him to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for that very nice introduction. It really is a pleasure to be here at the Wilson Center. I'll uh, point out over the uh, Thanksgiving holiday, I had the opportunity to actually visit Woodrow Wilson's birthplace in Stanton, Virginia. Um, and I'd also point out that, uh, as Lauren indicated, he was the only president with a PhD. He spent time at my alma mater, the Johns Hopkins University. So I've got to think, as we're sitting here, that Dr. President Wilson would have really uh, enjoyed this conversation and have actively engaged. I think we are um, projecting for him what his thoughts might have been. I also would have loved to have had the discussion with him from a hundred years ago as what his perspective on water issues were then compared to now. So let me start by uh, adding my good morning. I guess I should say good afternoon and perhaps even good evening to our audience uh, and appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today about key issues associated with the intersection of water, peace, and security. It's appropriate that we're talking about water on a rainy day here in Washington, D.C. I will also point out, as the head of the organization that handles the National Weather Service, that today's forecast, or today's weather is as forecast, okay? <laughs> Nobody gives us credit when we get it right. Um, but as we speak, I'd also point out that 57% of the lower 48 states, which is 360 million acres of crops and about 130 million people in the United States are in a drought state right now. Various extremes of drought, but at the same time, at NOAA, we're watching for flash flooding in the lower Mississippi Valley. So why are we here today? Why is water such an important topic? It's been an important topic, and its association with security and other aspects of security has, important, has been important for some time. But we're starting to see some extreme cases. We're starting to see things like we've never seen before. The nature of storms is changing. We saw five feet of rain fall in Hurricane Harvey, five feet. Just last year, New York City broke its rainfall rate record twice in a matter of a few weeks during uh, the latter most remnants of Hurricane Ida, a record that was uh, exceeded by uh, amounts of rainfall in excess of three inches per hour. Think about that. That's an extraordinary amount of water. 
The other thing we have to consider, and at, at our agency, NOAA, it's part and parcel of what we do, is the interrelated nature of hazards, that hazards are not isolated. They are intrinsically connected through the entire Earth system. So you'll see a lot of attention in what we do and the research we do around Earth system prediction to understand those intersections. We have to think about how things like fire and drought contribute to our understanding of how land will react to water. I had the opportunity to visit our weather forecast office in Pueblo, Colorado, where they're doing some extraordinarily innovative work on the role that burn scars play in flash flooding. And so first you have the fire, then you have the degradation of the, uh, the ground, if you will, the ground conditions, and then you basically have rechanneling and exacerbation of flooding conditions. And we're still learning. Atmospheric rivers. Uh, I remember when I was a, a, a young program manager, uh, probably about 25, 30 years ago, we learned about atmospheric rivers. And at the time, we thought, well, this is the isolated phenomenon that we're seeing in the Pacific Northwest responsible for major flooding. And so we spent a lot of time trying to develop um, concepts around forecast uh, in, uh, forecast informed reservoir operations. Well, if you look at that particular field of science, we now know that atmospheric rivers are a phenomenon on every continent in the globe. So a lot of things are changing, which means we better have our act together in agencies like mine, but not just mine, to have a new understanding of what are the contributors to both hydrology and meteorology. So today you're going to hear from a number of experts from a variety of sectors, from the public, private, academic, and from around the globe. I am very excited that we'll have an opportunity to hear and think about the global perspective in this event because, as I've argued in the environmental sciences and environmental policy, you cannot just treat the issues that are inherent to any particular domestic uh, partner. It was Isaac Asimov who said, saying that the Japanese have a pollution problem is like saying there's a leak in your end of the boat. This is a problem we're all having to face. We at NOAA have been in the business of water, and we're honored to be part of the discussions today. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, Roger Pulwardy, a senior scientist at NOAA's Physical Science Lab, will be part of the discussions. And I'll embarrass Roger right now by pointing out, if you all didn't know, he is the 2022 awardee of a Presidential Rank Award Distinguished Service Award. Congratulations, Roger. That's extraordinary. <laughs> Being able to predict the onset, location, movement, and amount and rate of precipitation, particularly in cases of extreme precipitation and drought, is something we know pretty well at NOAA, but we continue to improve. From the short-term warnings made within hours or minutes to the seasonal and annual predictions and projections that prove critical for water resource management out west, notably. And not just the meteorological forecast, this is an all of NOAA effort. We need to help communities better understand how three inches of rain in an hour will flow through their infrastructure or how critical power and generator systems need to be prepared for 10 or 20 inches of rain or five feet of rain over the course of several days. I'm pleased to say that NOAA's working hard in these areas, especially as they relate to a goal that we have established of being a climate-ready nation by 2030. Water prediction and security is fundamental to this concept of a climate-ready nation, and that's why we feel it's important in order to expand the full NOAA value chain for water prediction, meaning our data, our models, and services to all communities to help users across industry and regions, agriculture, energy, transportation, all of these are areas where our ability to improve the forecast is going to dramatically improve the safety, the economics associated with those sectors. And I want to share with you a couple of examples of some of the kinds of exciting work that we're doing to directly address those needs, those user needs, if you will. We have a precipitation prediction grant challenge, which is an effort to capitalize on the science and technology opportunities to provide a more accurate, more reliable, and timely precipitation forecast across timescales from hours to decades seamlessly through the development of a fully coupled Earth system 
prediction model. What we're hoping to accomplish with this is a few things. Obviously, better forecasts of extreme events, think catastrophic precipitation and flooding, more accurate hydrologic forecasts across time scales, uh, think about flash flooding impacts on water supplies, enhanced skill for prediction of atmospheric rivers and, and, and flash droughts, and new tools in AI-powered applications. Quick sidebar, if I can. Some of you may know that part of our responsibility to know is also managing the National Marine Fisheries uh, through our National Marine Fisheries Service. This is not an unrelated functionality. Many of these fish actually spawn in fresh water. Their ability to do so depends not just on the quantity, but the quality, think temperature, of that water as well. So the, the water models, the hydrologic models that include water quality components, such as temperature, are going to be critical not just for the immediately obvious applications, but also for the secondary, if you will, such as fisheries management. We have a new water model, version 3.0, is being developed, and we expect it to be implemented in the fourth quarter of next year. It will include total water forecasting, which means coupling the national water model with the National Ocean Services surge and tide operational forecast systems, as well as the Hurricane Center's probabilistic tropical storm surge forecast when available for tropical events. The water doesn't know the difference as to whether it's a storm surge or a precipitation event. We ought to be looking at those as the same kind of, or at least interrelated processes. And given that there are approximately 120 million people along the coasts, a first effort, ever, effort to combine freshwater and saltwater flood forecasts, it's going to be a change, a big change. That water model 3.0 will also include geographic domain expansion to the more populated regions of Alaska, including Cook Inlet and the Copper River Basin. Work is also being done in the National Weather Service with flood inundation mapping, one of our most sought after and critical pieces of information for emergency managers, water resource managers, and local governments ahead of, during, and in the aftermath of extreme precipitation is the flood inundation mapping. And currently, this is an internal product, but gradual rollout to the public will begin again in the fourth quarter of FY23 and should cover 100% of the U.S. by fiscal year 2026. On the longer term side, our Climate Prediction Center is collaborating with the National Integrated Drought Information System, NIDUS. If you've not heard of NIDUS, my first question is, what are you doing in this meeting? My second question is, please, or request is, please uh, learn about NIDUS. You're going to hear a lot about it here, and it represents the kind of capabilities that we've got to develop in support of uh, public services. So we're trying to improve the usability and the accuracy of our drought outlooks. Uh, we can't forget about the Cooperative Institute for Water Resources, the Cooperative Institute for Research to Operations in Hydrology, Cairo, as we affectionately call it, at the University of Alabama in uh, Tuscaloosa. And in fiscal year 21, we were instructed to establish this Cooperative Institute to focus solely on helping NOAA address nation's growing water challenges. It's a consortium of 28 partners. And so when we talk about a cooperative institute, it's not just cooperative between NOAA and the academic community. It's a lot of collaboration within the academic community there. And there are four primary areas where the CI is focused. Expand and improve water resource prediction capabilities, advance and accelerate community water resource modeling, advance and augment hydroinformatics by supporting research in the de development of geographic information systems in this area, using newest tools of AI and ML, and apply social, economic, and behavioral science to water resources to improve the delivery and efficacy of decision support services. Something at NOAA we've taken a new look at and recognized that decision making a lot of times is based on more than just having the hard facts in front, but also understanding the social behavior and the style in which people make decisions. We are investing almost $500 million in coastal and inland flood and inundation mapping and forecasting and next generation water modeling activities, including modernized precipitation frequency and probable maximum studies. With this includes updating the precipitation frequency estimates. Some of you may know that as Atlas 15, including effects of climate non-stationarity and supported 
supporting these efforts, of course, is the action by Congress through the passage of the bipartisan infrastructure law. We're also teaming up between our weather service and our research uh, line office on a $25 million effort to build out the soil moisture and snowpack instrumentation uh, at existing mesonate uh, locations in the Missouri Basin. And we're developing some standards-based hydrology and hydraulic model, model interoperability called the Next Generation Water Resources Modeling Framework. So you can see there's a lot going on in the observational side, in the collaboration side, in the decision support side, in the modeling side, the full spectrum of activities that are so central to what we'll be talking about here today. Before I leave, I just want to take a look over the horizon, if you will, a little bit further and dream a little bit bigger as well. I want to challenge you all to think about this as you hear from the, the brilliant minds that you're going to hear from today uh, and the presentations that they will share with you and the questions that they'll be faced with. There's a few things that we need to think about framing for the future. One is equity and services. Now, you've heard a lot about equity in services in this administration. I'll be quite honest. I came out of retirement to be the no administrator in part because I felt this administration was so appropriately focused on making sure that previously unserved or underserved or vulnerable communities had access to the products and services that they are paying for with their taxes. So by 2032, I mentioned the flood inundation mapping earlier. Everyone should have access to this kind of information, and we should be reaching everyone with flood inundation mapping. The national water model, <clears throat> we're working on version 3.0. I expect by 2032 we'll be on probably model 8.0, but it'll include factors like drainage and land cover. Where's the water going to flow? We'll already be making big advances with our forecast informed reservoir operations. What about fisheries regu regulations, forecast informed fisheries regulations? And the latest version coupled with the National Ocean Service surge and tidal operational forecast system, what about others? Where else do we need to see this kind of interoperability? And I think there's opportunities here in some of the more, if you will, tangible civil engineering side. So we can start talking about modeling durability, uh, sustainability of natural capital and built systems in a much more effective way than we than we are right now. So I'm pretty excited about the progress that we've made. When I started at NOAA, I can tell you hydrology was an afterthought. And I look around the audience, there's some folks that I worked with at NOAA 20 years ago, and you'll remember what, I was t what I'm talking about, that we have, we have started to recognize and working with our colleagues in uh, the, the alphabet soup of other federal agencies to make sure we're getting the best possible products for the American public, industry, our international partners, uh, and uh, the, the communities writ large. So I'm delighted to have had this opportunity to share with you a little bit of what we're doing right now and where we see the future going. And it is now my pleasure to turn the podium over to Elisa Offit to kick off the Water, Peace, and Security Tool launch. Elisa, thank you. Well, I'd like to start out by thanking Lauren for this introduction, the Wilson Center for hosting this wonderful event, and of course, Honorable Spinrad for the excellent remarks that provided context on the impacts of climate change and the concrete measures that NOAA is taking to build resilience in this field. If I can go ahead and start my slides. At the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership, we see this increasing pressure on our global freshwater resources as a result of factors like climate change, in addition to, of course, economic and population growth and environmental degradation. And we know that these pressures can add increasing water stress and result in perceived competition between communities, sectors, and states, which in turn can contribute to conflict dynamics. We see these concerns reflected in the World Economics Forum's perceived risk landscape where water-related crises and natural resource crises are consistently highly ranked in terms of likelihood and impact. We also see this in practice, where water stress has contributed to displacement, violent conflict, and delegitimization of governments. However, the link between water and conflict is complex, 
and as a result of many intervening factors that, of course, can facilitate conflict, but also cooperation. And given these potential outcomes in the context of growing water stress, it, there's a clear need to really interrogate further the interrelationships between water and human response so that we can support effective action and to transform these water-related risks. The Water, Peace, and Security Partnership was formed in 2018 in response to these needs. The interdisciplinary partnership involves six implementing partners with a global reach and a range of expertise that you can see on the middle line in the slide, and is supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands and the German Development Agency, GIZ. And our partnership really seeks to build the knowledge of these interrelationships between, quite simply, water, peace, and security. Our aim is to transform what we call a vicious cycle of water instability and poor water management into one that's more virtuous, or one that can support conflict-sensitive water management and water-sensitive conflict resolution. And we do so with both a global and regional approach. At the global scale, we developed a early warning tool that was launched in 2019 that forecasts hotspots of potential violent conflict over a one-year period. This tool provides a crucial first step in identification of areas of potential risk for local stakeholders, as well as for the broader development, defense, disaster relief, and diplomatic community to really target efforts and implement a more localized approach that can have a deeper understanding of the context, conflict drivers, and space for potential interventions. We pair this tool as well with training resources and online modules on our website and the release of quarterly analysis reports and these help build the capacity of actors to really analyze and also respond to the tool's findings. In parallel, we also have a regional engagement that we use to seek to really address these aims of our partnership and also are a means to ground truth our global tool. We engage in the regions highlighted here, which include Iraq, Kenya, Ethiopia, Mali, Niger, and Chad, and we use a inclusive participatory method to develop a shared understanding of the hydrologic system and human response. We then build this understanding into models and decision support tools like the policy dashboard that you can see underneath our understand category. And then we use this in an integrated approach with awareness raising, capacity development, and dialogue to jointly support conflict sensitive decision making and mitigation of tensions. At the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership, we believe that the Global Early Warning Tool can really spread opportunities for more stakeholders to identify potential conflict risks and engage in mitigation of their impacts with timely, informed, and effective action. Because of this, we sought to improve our tool, and we are thrilled to launch it today. And on that note, it is my honor to introduce Kitty van der Heiden to officially launch the Water, Peace, and Security Tool in tandem with the release of new online learning modules. Ms. van der Heiden is the Director General for International Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands, where her responsibilities include development cooperation policy, implementation, and funding. She also formerly served as the Vice President and Director of Africa and Europe at the World Resources Institute, as the Dutch Ambassador for Sustainable Development, and as Ambassador for the Millennium Development Goals, among other positions at the United Nations and the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ms. van der Heiden has supported the Water, Peace, and Security Project since its inception, and we are thrilled to have her join us today from our parallel event held at the Hague Center for Strategic Studies to celebrate this global launch. So with that, I'd like to welcome Kitty to take the floor and provide her remarks via our live feed. Let's see if you can all hear me over there in the Wilson Center. We can. Hear I you. hope that, that I hope that that works. Hi everyone, and hi everyone who's online. I'm here with a good group of friends, all friends of making sure that water is being used as a tool for cooperation and not an instrument of war. And unfortunately, I will honestly admit I don't readily have the quote by Woodrow Wilson, but I do have the quote that I grew up with that my mum always gave me by another US president. And that's also what guides me in my work and guides my 
colleagues in international development cooperation, and that is that the greatest gift in life is to work hard at work worth doing. Work hard at work worth doing. And I think that is why I'm so incredibly excited about this work on water, peace and security, because water is at the heart of the ecosystems which influences lives and livelihoods. It, 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 economies depend on it. And it will actually, if we do it well, and I'll come to speak uh, about that, it will enhance peace and enhance security and stability. Now, Dr. Spinrod was talking about when he started out at NOAA a long time ago. You know, but when I started out in development cooperation, which is well over 30 years ago, water was just one thing. Water was wash. Water was drinking water and water was health. And maybe about 10 years after that, we started to realize, well, maybe water has something to do with food and stability as well, because, you know, 70% of fresh water goes to food production. So that sort of began to become a more influential narrative. But now that we see that water is becoming more and more scarce, we see that water actually is absolutely crucial to grow your economy. There's no politician that can do this without energy. And you need inordinate amounts of water for thermal energy, for nuclear energy, for hydropower. You actually need it for manufacturing. Where do you think your car came from? Well, it came from a factory that used an inordinate amount of water to cool uh, steel production. And of course, for those that are following COP15, you need it for water. We are undermining not just lives and livelihoods, entire economies, but we're also undermining the very nature on which all of us, including our civilization, depends. And I always find it weird to think that, you know, we have as much water now as we have at the time of the dinosaurs. Nothing really has changed. Though it shifts in form, whether it's, you know, liquid in lakes and rivers, or it's as moisture in the air, or it's in the ice in the polar regions or the glacier, it is the same. But things are changing, and they're changing faster than we can policy-wise follow up to prevent the impacts. For example, climate change. All the impacts, or most of the impacts, not all the impacts, most of the impacts come through the hydrological cycle, right? Which changes the supply and availability of water. Higher evaporation, less or more rainfalls, more moisture in the air leads to hurricanes. But what is very often forgotten, and that's what I try to do with my colleagues, we actually aim to stimulate demand. That's a weird thing, right? But by bringing development to poorer nations than ourselves, what we're actually doing is increasing demand for water. We're now 8 billion people on this planet. Water is already scarce. Just imagine that they would all live like we do. It's incredibly comfortable, but it would be a terrible disaster if we do not change our consumption patterns. And then, of course, we have the issue that we have a lot of water though it's unevenly distributed, right? I mean, 15% of the global fresh water is in the Amazon. How many people live there? Very few, but you can't just pipe it up to North America. But we have a major problem with pollution. So we have water, supply is going down, demand is going up, supply is also going down due to pollution, and we have very weak global governance. So what I see is a toxic cocktail of problems that are coming up that we can't really deal with. And you know, figures differ. Some say it's two and a half billion. Some say it's four billion people that are confronted with water scarcity. Well, whether it's two and a half or four, it's a heck of a lot of people that at least part of the year have to cope and grapple with water scarcity. And it's mostly the poor people that are um, impacted most. Now, I mentioned that it's not just supply and demand. I think a big factor here is inadequate water management and very weak governance. That is something that we can do something about. It's something that we, through development cooperation, try to uh, ameliorate, including with the involvement of local communities. Because if we don't deal with this, you have a very toxic cocktail of lives and livelihoods threatened, economy threatened, and therefore the security and peace of communities if not countries that are at stake. Now, again, when I started my work well over 30 years ago in the Foreign Office, what's, what in our imagination and what was the reality, I think, at that time, what disrupts people's lives? When do they start to walk? When do they become 
you know, an IDP or a refugee, very often it was related to political turmoil. It was about human rights violations. It was about dictators that limited civil space. At that time, peace and security was linked in our framing to accountability, to legitimacy of power and to the representation of local communities. And it still is, but we have an incredibly big looming nascent disaster in the peace, security and development nexus, which is water insecurity. If we do not treat water insecurity as the threat that it is, it will become at the root cause of tensions within and between countries. So that's why this whole issue of natural resource management and water predominantly is so important for us. Work hard and work worth doing. This is about lives and livelihoods of poor people that we must protect. And then again, it's not just about the sort of natural resource management and the water management, it is also about dealing with the distributional impacts, right? If water is scarce, who gets water? Is it the big food and agri business? Is it the energy business? Or is it the smallholder farmer that basically needs this to survive? I know how politics work. I think you know that too. The poor are always the ones that are worst off. The tool that we're launching today is something, I, I know we're celebrating three years and I have some of the birth mothers here around the table, but it was actually started almost 10 years ago. 10 years ago, when in the foreign office, we started to launch the discussion on planetary security, which is now fairly mainstream that yes, natural resource challenges have an impact on peace and stability around the world. We need to better predict where a crisis may occur when we predict, we may be better able to prevent it. And in the case that we can't prevent it, we need to prepare so that at least poor people, lives and livelihoods are protected against worse. Three years ago, the uh, WPS Global Early Warning Tool was launched working with, and I think that's a really new combination of communities, development, diplomacy, defense and disaster risk management. They came together and it was a super exciting journey really to start to predict, prepare, and prevent, what do we do with water? It doesn't uh, go by jurisdictional boundaries that we have drawn up as, as, uh, as bureaucracies and politicians. So how do we deal with this and what, when water is transboundary? And now we have a new feature that makes this tool more accurate, even more sophisticated, more demand-driven, because in addition to long-term forecast, we're launching a short-term model that now estimates the intensity and the direction of conflicts for the coming two months, right? So we can actually get ready just in time, hopefully, to prepare. And then it also helps us to understand the root causes of these conflicts. So we can actually develop much more targeted interventions to prevent the worst from happening. Now, I'm incredibly excited that later you'll see uh, a demo of the new tool. I think this is absolutely what is needed. We need to expose and quantify those complex interrelationships. And we need to use that to make sure that we bring the perspective of a life in dignity to poor people that can defend themselves. And so a few last words I wanted to use to basically highlight something that I think is incredibly exciting, but also incredibly scary. And, you know, if I, I hope this doesn't show on screen, but if I look older than my, my years, it is because I'm also preparing for the UN Water Conference. Now the UN Water Conference will be held in New York in the third week of March. And it will be the first UN conference in almost 50 years. Just imagine such a major problem. You need it for everything. You can live without love, but you cannot live without water. It was almost 50 years ago that we had the last UN Water Conference. The next time this happens, I will be pushing up the daisies. I'm sure Dr. Spinrod will be pushing up the daisies as well, provided there's still enough water to water the daisies. And here we are. What are we going to deliver for the world? Are we going to do better? And I remember the Rio Plus 20 summit when the only time that cups of coffee were literally thrown across the conference room when we were negotiating was about transboundary water. Well, this is our chance. We have agreed to have five interactive dialogues as a UN, all 194 countries about water for cooperation. That includes transboundary and cross-sectoral water cooperation. This summit may finally help us to prevent and prepare for transboundary and cross-sectoral trade-offs 
and risks, bringing together development, diplomacy, disaster risk communities, and defense. We can actually now finally, for the first time in the UN, talk about this. Tools such as the one we are launching today will help the non-water experts, such as most of us here, understand what risks we're playing with. It will also help them understand what we can do about it in the preventive atmosphere. And let's not forget that this is really about working hard at work worth doing. Where do you think most of the infrastructure has been demolished on water? In 31st of October, few people know this, in Kiev, 80% of people in Kiev had no access to water. Why? Because the Russians decided to bomb. More than 20 million people in the Horn at this moment go hungry because there isn't enough water to grow crops. Pakistan was just flooded. A third of the entire country was underwater. The Grand Renaissance Dam might lead to God knows what. There are so many pressures and there are so many ways in which we can deal with this. We have to work hard at work worth doing based on the best available scientific knowledge we have, such as the one that we get from NOAA and now from the WPS tool. I'm very happy to be present at this launch. Let's come together and get it done. Back to you at the Wilson Center. Thank you, Ms. Van der Heiden, for your very insightful remarks, leadership in the field, and support of the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership. Now that the tool has been officially launched, I'm ha happy to introduce Samantha Kuzma to provide a demonstration of the tool. Samantha is the Acting Director of the Aqueduct Project at the World Res Resources Institute and is also the project manager of global research within the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership. She has played, she's been instrumental in the development of the global tools that we use, and I'm happy to invite her to the stage to provide the demonstration now. Okay, I'm gonna wait for my slides to come up. Hi, everyone. My name is Samantha Kuzma, and today I am here to walk you through a demonstration of our newly launched enhanced uh, WPS Global Early Warning Tool. So as Kitty and Alyssa had mentioned, you know, to give you a little bit of, of context and background into this research, as WPS was started, it, it was really started in part to help promote this idea that water is a critical underpinning to peace and human security. But as we started our work, we found that many across our audience, as broad as that was from development to disaster relief to defense, lacked the near real time tools and analysis that they needed to be able to adequately respond to these water issues and conflicts. And so our team got to work researching new models and data that could help, uh, help these audience address these conflict issues. And in 2019, we launched the first version of our global early warning tool. And we launched this tool with the mission to help our audience understand where, when, and why conflicts were happening so that they could go out into the world and enable timely and effective water-related interventions that could help mitigate the conflicts and promote peace. And since this launch in 2019, we've continued to stay engaged with our audience and to learn from them, specifically learn how our tool was serving them and what it could be doing better at. And we learned that while our forecast was helpful, it was also a little too vague for some in our audience. They needed more information into the direction and intensity of conflict. We found that some within our audience needed to understand the underlying drivers of the conflict so that they could better address the interventions. And so our team got to work again, researching more models and more data, and I'm excited to launch those today because I think they can help better serve your work. So before I dive into the demonstration, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of, of context into the new research. I'm gonna go over our enhanced conflict forecast, which now includes both a long-term and short-term prediction. I'll then preview our brand new regional causal models where we try to quantify the linkage between water and conflict using advanced statistical methods. And finally, I will walk through a demonstration of the new global tool. So let's get started with our long-term conflict risk indicator. So this indicator is an updated version of what we had on our tool previously. So if you're familiar with that, I wanna just uh, highlight one major change, 
We're now forecasting at the administrative level one. This is the state or provincial level rather than the, the county or district because we found this to be a more useful level for hotspot identification, which is one of the primary purposes of this data set. So I recommend that you use this data if you're interested in understanding where conflict may be happening in the upcoming year. The way we do this is we've built a machine learning based model that predicts conflict in the upcoming year. Specifically, we try to understand if a location will experience at least 10 fatalities over the next year. And once we have that forecast in hand, we then look to the past and say, okay, what happened over the past 12 months? Did we reach that conflict threshold of at least 10 fatalities? And using these two data points, we're able to derive our risk category. So we can label conflicts as either ongoing, emerging, or below the threshold. And this is gonna be really useful if you are identifying emerging, hot uh, emerging conflict hotspots um, especially if you are trying to prioritize locations against each other and for long-term strategic planning. But say, you know, you, you've used this conflict forecast, but you need a little bit more information, more insight into the, the nature of the conflict. I recommend you look at our brand new short-term estimate of intensity and direction. So I would use this tool if I'm interested in understanding when conflict can be expected and how much conflict we can expect. So again, we've created another type of machine learning model for this prediction. We're specifically using something called a long short-term memory model, LSTM for short. And this is a really powerful model to be using because an LSTM can actually learn from the sequence in which events happen. And for something like conflict, which is so time dependent, right? What happened last month really matters for this month. That model becomes a really powerful tool for us. And so we use this model to predict our conflict intensity in the upcoming two months. And then once again, we look behind us to see what happened in the past two months. And this gives us a sense of direction, right? We're seeing is the conflict getting worse or is it getting better in this moment in time? And so these are the two new heat maps that we have added to our online tool that can help you understand intensity and direction. And again, this is gonna be really useful for those working more closely on the ground at the regional or local level. So if you need agile responsing, if you need to be planning, say, upcoming travel or events, this could be a really useful tool in helping you understand those logistics. In addition, it's gonna be really helpful for benchmarking, right? We now have that intensity, and so you can look at two different places and understand how those intensity of conflict compare. And because this is a new model, I just wanna show off its uh, performance a little bit because I'm still frankly pretty amazed by it. So on average, we are correct within plus or minus two events, but the best way to really understand this performance is to compare it to a baseline model. So in this case, we're gonna look at what's called a naive model that's simply saying, you're guessing the number of conflicts that happened this month equal the number of conflicts that happened last month. So I'm showing this through the dotted gray line, which is plotted next to the actual conflict events. And you can see, right, whenever there's a conflict peak, the naive forecast model is one month behind. But when we add our LSTM, you can see that we can actually stay in step with the conflict peaks and valleys. And so we have that cutting edge ability here to, to understand where conflict is going before it happens. And I will show you those predictions in action in the demonstration. But I wanna end with um, the overview with just discussing these new causal models. So we call them regional causal models because we've developed seven different models based on the seven regions of the world as defined by the World Bank. And so within each region, we look at every country contained in that region, every district level, and we take one moment in time. This is a snapshot into one month. And we pull out all of the data and we, we build basically three different causal models that we benchmark against each other. And we run thousands of iterations of these models until we start to really see the complex connection between these indicators come out and we can start to quantify that relationship. And I see your faces. This is a very hard thing to just like hear about. So I'm actually gonna show you what these look like um, by going to our tool. So you can find our causal models by just going to our tool in our global tool dropdown and selecting causal models. And that brings you to our overview page. And so here is where we explain um, why we created these models, uh, what their purpose is. 
And then we provide what we call our causal model 101. We know that this is new research, and so we want to provide as much content as possible to help you understand what these models are and how you can interpret them. So we talk about the structure of the model, the way to read them. We also provide a section on our methodology so you can learn a little bit more about how we created them. And at the bottom of this overview page, we have maps of each of the seven regions that you can explore. And these are clickable maps. It's one way to access the actual causal graphs. And so right now, we will select one for Sub-Saharan Africa. So when you get to the page, you can see all of the countries included in this modeling exercise. And as you scroll down, you come to the actual graph. So we have the causal model graph right here. And next to it, we've written up some text to help you with the interpretation. We want to make this as easy as possible for you to understand. We also provide data details, so we have links to the raw data if you're interested in exploring the data that was used to create these models. And finally, we continue the causal model 101. So we describe the statistics that we use to quantify these relationships and describe it in a way that we hope is really accessible to our audience. And finally, we end with our assumptions and limitations to kind of put these models in place so you understand how you can use them and, and what their limitations are. So let's look a little bit more closely at this model. If you can see it, I apologize for those in the back. But um, the, the indicators that have the three little stars next to it, these are our statistically significant indicators. That means that not only were they identified as really important in this modeling exercise, but we expect to see that relationship in the real world outside of our sample data set. And so just my interpretation reading through this, right? I'm seeing indicators like precipitation, cornfields, evapotranspiration, density of greenness, which is all about vegetation health. So I'm, I'm understanding that the, the nexus between food and water is, is really important in this location. And I'm going to keep that in mind as I move over to the demonstration. Oops, that's the wrong button. OK, so now we are at the Global Tool demonstration. And just to make this a little bit more fun, I wanted to give us a story to go through. So let's say I am an analyst at a government agency, and my department is really worried about the drought in the Horn of Africa. I recently was at a conference where I heard WPS talk about this region in Kenya, Turkana. I learned that it's the largest permanent desert lake. I learned that there are many pastoralists here, and they are particularly vulnerable to droughts and erratic rainfall. And I also learned that there is a lack of access to infrastructure that could be used to help alleviate the impacts of the drought. So I went to the WPS website, I looked at the causal models, I picked out a few indicators that I want to investigate a little bit more on the global tool, ones that relate to agriculture, food, and water. Okay, so again, to access the global tool, you just go to our dropdown and select map. And this is an interactive map, so you can move it around and you can zoom in and out to places and, and go to your location of interest. So right now I'm gonna zoom into Kenya and click on Turkana. And as you can see in the brown tab, we actually name the state there, so you can guarantee that you're actually looking at the place you think you're looking if you did not do well in geography class. Um, so the, the first thing I'm gonna look at is our long-term forecast, right? I wanna prioritize or see if I should prioritize this region. And I see that we have a, a risk category of ongoing conflict. That means there were at least 10 fatalities last year, and we're forecasting that to continue this year. So this is still on my list, and I want to dig a little bit deeper. So I'm going to get rid of that first forecast, and now look at the new short term. OK, I'm seeing there's definitely some conflict events that we're forecasting. And this is the same that happened in the past two months. So there's this steady drumbeat of conflict happening in near real time here. So this is an, an active location that I definitely want to look into a little bit further. So let me clear my map. I always like to start clear. And I'm going to go add some data sets. So our tool offers a variety of data categories for you to explore. Right now, I'm going to explore food. And I want to understand where are crops grown and where does that understand with where pasture land is? Because I know there's a lot of pastoralists in this area, and there could be some tension between those two groups. So I've added my data, but I can't really see the cropland data, so I'm going to move it up. I can mess around with the transparency to help with my analysis and interpretation. 
And okay, I see there's pasture land throughout this region. There's actually not a lot of crops grown here, but the crops that are grown are irrigated. And that means they're gonna rely on surface water and probably be competing with that same surface water as the pastoralist. So these places where those things intersect, that's something I'm gonna to wanna to talk to my local team about to understand a little bit more. Um, I'm also gonna add one more indicator here about vegetation health, because I remember that coming up in the causal model. And okay, I'm seeing a lot of brown, but I'm not a water person, I don't know what this means, so I'm gonna go to our information button and read a little bit more about this indicator so I can interpret it. And I see here that it says the, the values closer to zero mean extremely poor vegetation health. And so now I'm seeing that this place is really suffering, likely from that long-term drought that I was reading about. But just to you know, further understand that, I'm gonna add on the WPS drought mask. This is looking at the 24 month precipitation anomalies, um, places that have severe, uh, moderate to severe drought over a two year period at least. And I see a lot of my location is impacted by this. And I also wanna know, is there relief coming, right? So I'm gonna add a precipitation forecast to this to see what's happening in the next three months. Are we gonna get rain? Is, is this condition gonna get better? And I see that it's still forecasted to be dry. It's not severe, but it's also not the relief that this place needs. Okay, so I'm gonna clear my map again, and I'm gonna explore one more topic, which is the infrastructure topic that came up in that presentation. So I'm gonna go to my map and I'm gonna go to the infrastructure tab and add roads and dams. I wanna know if the roads can, uh, if there are enough roads to help me transport materials to provide relief. I wanna know if there are reservoirs and dams at a large enough scale that people can use in times of drought to alleviate the symptoms of that drought. And I see compared to other places in Kenya, um, this has very few or it's, uh, it's not a densely populated uh, map in terms of road coverage, especially in the eastern part of this map. I also see there are no major reservoirs in this state. There is one right on this border that I wanna zoom into. And I wanna understand a little bit more about this reservoir to see if this is something that maybe of, um, is an important feature in this area. So I'm gonna add a data set that tells me if the reservoir is wetter or drier than normal. This is looking at anomalies in the reservoir. And I actually see that this one is doing okay. I wanna learn a little bit more because I, I just have a feeling that this could be something important. And so I'm gonna add another data set. This now is telling me uh, how energy is produced in different areas. And it is really hard to see on this map. I don't know if I can get the um, laser pointer, but there, I promise you there is a tiny blue dot there that indicates that this is a hydro facility. So this dam is also being used to create hydroelectricity, um, which is just another, another competing use of that water, something that I definitely wanna make note of. And just out of curiosity, I wanna understand in Kenya, do people have good access to electricity? So I'm gonna add one more data set and see that in the past 15 years, the access to electricity in Kenya has really skyrocketed. Um, but this is a national data set, and I don't know if this is represented, representative of the region I'm in. So this is another question that I wanna approach our local team to understand. Okay, and then just one final data set. I've also added a data set on food markets. There were no food markets um, labeled in our region. It doesn't mean they don't exist. It's just not within our data set. But I am seeing that all of the food markets around our state are in crisis mode. And that's a proxy to me that I need to check in on food supply in this region. I think that this could be another really important issue. And so now using the WPS tool, I've gone from not knowing anything about the region to having near real time understanding of critical aspects of these people's lives from food to water to energy. So this is a really amazing tool to help you start your process and, and start to think about how you can approach these situations. Um, I'll just zoom past these last slides. As Alyssa said, we have e-learnings on our website uh, videos that could help you uh, if you're struggling in understanding how to use the tool. We also have a methodology page that goes in detail about how we've created our forecast models. So all of that information is there. 
And as I end, I want to give a big um, thank you to everyone listed on the slide for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the Netherlands for the funding and support to make this work possible and for all of the researchers and all of their time in, in creating these data sets. So thank you to everyone. And I will leave you with this thought, right? As amazing and excited as I am about all of the new research we shared today, its ultimate success really lays in the hands, in your hands, in, in what you do with it. And so I wanna say now, right, you have the analysis at your fingertips, and I'm really excited to see what you do with it. Thank you so much. I bet you all have so many questions. Um, that was really extraordinary, Samantha. Thank you for walking us through the tool. Um, I'm, I'm excited to hear more from Charles on the panel. Uh, so I'm gonna invite our panel up to the floor and we have a couple people who are gonna be joining remotely, so you'll see them on the screen in just a minute. Um, we're very pleased to welcome our distinguished guest, engineer Hatem Hamid Hussain, the Director of General of Iraq's National Center for Water Resources Management, a formation of the Ministry of Water Resources, joining us from Iraq. Also joining us remotely is Sarah Hyatt, who is coming to us from Pakistan. Sarah specializes in climate change law and policy and has extensive experience working on climate in the context of Pakistan, including advising the government on preparing Pakistan's updated nationally determined contributions. Charles Iceland is joining us just from across the district, where he is the Global Director of Water with the World Resources Institute's Food, Forests, Water, and Ocean Programming. In addition to overseeing the global water team, Charles is implementing the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership with several European and American partner organizations, which you all just heard about. Uh, all the way from Boulder, Colorado, <laughs> we have, yes, <laughs> yeah. and coming from the second row, exactly, we have Roger Polwardi, Senior Scientist in NOAA's Physical Sciences, Laboratory. Roger is a longtime partner of ECSPs and co leads our project to improve predictive capabilities for the security risks posed by climate change. As an advisor on early warning and adaptation to national and international agencies, and someone who is regularly tapped to act as a lead author on things like the IPCC and U.S. national climate assessments, Roger is really helping to build that connective tissue between decision makers, scientific agencies, and communities. And finally, we're delighted to have our global fellow, Sharon Burke, moderate today's panel. Sharon is the president of Ecospherics, a re research and advisory organization and an advisor to the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership. She was previously the director of resource uh, security at New America and has served in a number of uh, senior U.S. government positions in the State Department and at the Pentagon, most recently as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Operational Energy and an advisor to the Biden-Harris transition team. So Sharon, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. And uh, thank you for your leadership at, here at the Wilson Center. We are here because you are here. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to be part of the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership and to watch this model from its, from its uh, very beginnings and to have, play a small part in that. And in case you didn't know, uh, Samantha, who you just heard from, is one of the people who built this model. So she's not just presenting to you, uh, and Liz Sakosha is here too with us. Um, and you'll hear from Charlie, who overs uh, oversaw the, the birth of this project. So um, I wanted to start out by saying three things. First of all, you heard from Administrator Spinrad that we're in unprecedented times. Like if you think about why do we need these kinds of tools and this kind of decision support? Well, first of all, we are in unprecedented times. The level of environmental change um, and human change is unprecedented. And secondly, it's, it's a, a lot of complexity. Figuring out how all of these variables and factors interact to create insecurity or to create peace is increasingly difficult. So those are two drivers. But then when you talk about a decision support tool like this where it all comes together, is, is does it actually help support people on the ground? Like you heard Samantha say several times, and then you will go to your local team. Because the real question is, no matter how wonderful a tool like this is, it's only really wonderful if it's used and if it supports people who are actually making the difficult decisions. And that's the last thing I wanted to say, is that because we're in this unprecedented time and we have all this complexity, and then you know the difficult decisions, those decisions are even more difficult with all of that because we're going to have to prioritize. There is so much need, so much that has to be done and only so much money and so many people to carry it out. 
And tools like this can help you understand better what these causal elements and causal links are and where you should put your effort and your money. So it's very exciting to be here today for this conversation. And, and what we're going to do is, Lauren already introduced our speakers. We're going to go one at a time, and each is going to give an opening comment of about five minutes. And then we'll have some discussion, and then we'll turn to you for your questions. Um, so first, I would like to invite Sarah Hyatt, who is joining us from Pakistan. Um, Sarah, if you're on and you're ready, we'd like to hear from you. And I, it, you know, I'm sure I don't have to tell the people in this room that when you're talking about water, peace, and security, that there are a, a couple of places in the world where this is very much a vibrant and present and pressing concern. And we're going to hear from people who are in two of those places. And first is Pakistan. Sarah, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hi. I hope everybody can hear me. We hear you great. We can't see you, but we can hear you. There you are. We can see you now. Welcome, Sarah. I hope I'm not lagging. You look perfect. Great. Uh, so thanks for having me. This tool sounds incredibly splendid, and I hope that we will put it to good use in Pakistan um, if it has data on Pakistan, because I don't, I don't know about that. Um, but uh, just in the interest of time, uh, I will jump right into my part of the conversation. And, and thank you for setting the background like you did. Uh, so water security and peace is very sort of, it's, it's on the forefront in Pakistan. Pakistan is a water scarce nation. And unfortunately, a very large population of about 230 million and growing poor water management on the supply side. Uh, inequitable distribution of water, and then of course climate change is making all of it much worse for us. Um, for Pakistan, water and security is synonymous to poverty, um, and also to inequitable distribution of water within the country itself. Now for the purposes of this talk, I can neatly divide the uh, inter and intrastate uh, water and security uh, nexus, um, and nexus for, for the audience. Now, um, if you talk about Pakistan and India, I think you talk about, you definitely have to mention uh, the Indus Water Treaty and the water woes that the countries have experienced. So Pakistan and India entered into the Indus Water Treaty back in about 1960. Um, it, this was supposed to be a hallmark of diplomacy, but unfortunately hasn't always been. Under the Indus Water Treaty, Pakistan gets the three Western rivers and India gets the three Eastern rivers. Um, and, but uh, India's uh, upstream location, geographic location, gives it privilege to control water inflow into Pakistan and also and to restrict water flow into Pakistan, a privilege that they uh, tend to uh, they tend to ab uh, abuse. Uh, historically, India has restricted water flow into Pakistan after the first war over Kashmir, causing millions of acres of agricultural land to go into drought. Uh, as late as, uh, alternatively, as late as in 2019, India ended up releasing a lot of water into Pakistan's Western River, one of, one of Pakistan's Western Rivers, and caused about 19 districts to be flooded. Um, now, water is uh, used to, sp to spring nationalism in India. Every time general elections are coming up, water becomes a huge topic with statements passed by Prime Minister Modi very recently, like saying something like blood and water can't flow together or that uh, water will be channeled from Pakistan's Western rivers to the farmers in Haryana in India. Um, and this is what's happening on, uh, on the Indian front where nationalism is brewing because of water um, and, and political, uh, and, it's, it's, and it's general elections are won based on water. But on the Pakistani side, India's statements like these end up giving the government margin to cover up their own water mismanagement, <clears throat> excuse me, by saying that India is responsible for Pakistan's water woes. All of this ends up creating hostility on both sides of the water. It also causes tensions to keep high, uh, something that shouldn't be there. Um, and then especially amongst poor farmers in, in Pakistan who, or who automatically end up feeling hostile towards India because they feel like not, them not getting water is a political thing, whereas it is not necessarily the case, as I will speak about a little later. On the western side of Pakistan's border is Afghanistan. We rely on the Kabul River 
to um, uh, to act to uh, provide water to uh, to our northern and southern provinces as well. India is is has committed to funding dams on it. There have been diplomatic attempts by Pakistan, but unfortunately, they haven't really sort of um, uh, birthed any positive results. Now, I mentioned the both of these uh, specifically because I'd like to just say that if each country and its citizens need water and each country and its citizens should have the security associated with water. Um, and also that uh, water should never be political. It, it should just be a basic human right and something you know that you're going to get irrespective of the political health of a region. Um, I'm going to segue into the intrastate uh, security aspects of, of water and conflict, amongst which the first and foremost is of course agriculture. Agri uh, pa Pakistan is primarily an agrarian economy with agriculture providing about 19.2% to our GDP. It provides direct employment to about 39% of the country, many of which are women. Unfortunately, our agriculture is suffering because of lack of water. 90% of agriculture produced or food produced in Pakistan is um, in irrigated water. If we don't have irrigated water, we don't have agriculture. Uh, without water in our canals, without water in our rivers, uh, we are uh, relying on groundwater or farmers are relying on groundwater and groundwater sources are depleting. Now linked to this is when farmers can no longer grow, uh, grow food, when crops aren't growing, when, li when livelihoods are being impacted because of lack of water, farmers and a lot of people from rural communities will migrate to the urban centers. Um, happens a lot in, in the southern part of the country especially. And it's not like the uh, it's not like these migrants go to cities to cities to big cities and find jobs. No, they end up living in slums. They end up searching for work. They don't always get it, and it's cyclical. Uh, when food when farmers migrate to cities, there is a decrease in food supply, which causes the prices of food and commodities to rise. All of this is cyclical. All of this causes uh, unrest, and it and and it stresses already overburdened cities. Um, by uh, uh, by putting pressure on limited water and sanitary facilities within them. Next, I'll talk about climate change. Um, uh, something uh, Pakistan is one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to uh, to climate change. We all we we rank within the top ten most vulnerable, and one of the reasons is of course uh, um, a, a large population, our, our topography but also the fact that we have glaciers. Uh, this region of the planet hosts the third largest ice mass in the world after the North and the South, uh, South Pole. We have about 8,000 beautiful and equally um, destructive glaciers. Third, uh, when, when, with global warming, glaciers are receding and they're melting. This causes glacial lake outburst floods or GLOFs. Pakistan has about 33 glacial lake outburst floods that are hostile and can flood at any point. Uh, unfortunately for us, we don't have early warning systems in place. Uh, an early warning system in this part of the world would basically mean loud sirens when a glacial lake outburst flood is expected. What has started to happen is that the meteorological department now closely monitors glacial lake outburst floods. And when, this, when it senses that lakes are swollen or there's excess water in them, they will evacuate the citizens uh, living in villages around the, uh, <clears throat> around the, uh, around the gloss. Uh, this does help save lives and in 2022 um, um, many were successfully evacuated but property but damage to property was still experienced by people mentioning gloss ties in with the floods that we experienced in 2022 unprecedented and catastrophic um, um, a, a, a big contributor to these gloss uh, to these floods were, was glacial lake outburst floods or flash floods or glaciers melting we experienced an unprecedented amount of water that came from the north towards the south of the region because of glaciers melting. Um, this caused 33 million people to be displaced. This caused one third of the country to be submerged under water. It, um, in the wake of floods, you have water, the lack of clean drinking water uh, causes waterborne diseases. It causes people to migrate to cities all over again. It also causes skirmishes for food and water uh, amongst flood affectees or, fl or those impacted by the floods. Um, in after the 2010 flood, when Pakistan also experienced horrendous floods, 
there were um, unsubstantiated but reports of um, Islamic militant organizations that were recruiting jihadists from amongst the flood effectees. They would provide them relief and then they would recruit them. So the impacts of water and security and conflict are far reaching really. Um, now, I don't know if I have more time, but I can come back if there's time later. We, we, will, we will definitely be coming back to you. Thank you for the opening remarks. That's very helpful. Um, we are also joined um, uh, online by the Director General of the National Center for Water Resources Management in the Republic of Iraq Ministry of Water Resources. Are you there, Director General? Okay, we'll, we'll proceed then and just let us know if he's, if he's back on and we'll, and we'll hear. And one of the reasons that we were um, excited to hear from him too is that it is a place where the Water, Peace and Security Partnership is hands-on actively. So um, again, as you heard from Sarah, part of what we wanted to get at here is what does this look like to people on the ground um, as far as water, peace, and security, and how does information help? Um, so Charlie, if we could turn to you now, um, if Sorry. you would like to give your yeah. remarks, that would be very helpful. All right, uh, well, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, if we have people uh, far to our east. Um, my name's Charlie Iceland. I, I direct the water program at WRI. And uh, I, I'm very um, pleased to, to see all of you here attending and all of you online. Um, <clears throat> now, the Water, Peace, and Security Partnership uh, aims to address water security, uh, the water and security nexus through a variety of uh, activities. One, of course, is developing uh, new cutting edge tools and data. Um, but we also do analyses uh, to raise awareness uh, at, at global, national, and, and local levels. Uh, we try to build the, the capacity of stakeholders to better manage their, their water resources. Where appropriate, we, we uh, intervene to, to support dialogue among uh, parties that are in conflict, uh, not, not necessarily violent conflict all the time. Um, and we do all this in order to try to turn uh, vicious cycles of water insecurity into virtuous cycles of water-based peace and cooperation, as Alyssa uh, stated in, in her opening remarks. Now, we're very interested in uh, violent conflict as a, a possible endpoint uh, of water-related pressures, uh, but that's not the only outcome we're interested in looking at, uh, nor is it uh, the only one we, we do analysis around. Uh, we also look at how water pressures contribute to forced migration, uh, how water pressures lead to acute food insecurity, a waterborne disease, as Sarah mentioned, that, that's a secondary impact of the floods in Pakistan, for example. Um, we're very interested looking at how extreme temperatures are increasingly affecting uh, people and, and nature, uh, both directly and indirectly through the hydrological cycle. So, so uh, a lot of the uh, floods in Pakistan, Sarah mentioned, uh, uh, took effect because of extremely uh, unprecedentedly high temperatures. I, I think unprecedented might be the word of this, uh, this workshop here. Um, but we are, you know, it's an accurate word. Uh, we're also interested in knock-on effects. Uh, uh, no ad administrator uh, mentioned uh, some of these uh, uh, wildfires and, and uh, you know, how they can contribute to um, uh, d damaging mudslides uh, and, and, and those types of secondary and tertiary impacts. We're also interested in how uh, weather extremes lead to pest infestations. Uh, this uh, pest infestation uh, uh, damaged a lot of crops in East Africa, in the Arabian Peninsula, Peninsula and then into, into South Asia even. And then while we're, we're mostly looking at national and subnational uh, level conflict, um, <clears throat> we're also cognizant of the fact that water uh, crosses international boundaries and is leading to increasing tensions in, in places like the Nile Basin uh, or the, the Tigris and Euphrates 
uh, or the Indus, as Sarah mentioned, uh, or the Mekong, uh, uh, or even uh, many of our own basins here in the United States. Uh, um, well, y you know, we're, we're not in violent conflict in the United States yet, but it's possible. We, we have some people trying to, to take matters into their own hands in, in places like Northern California. Uh, so it's, it's not impossible that that could happen even in a developed country such as our own. Well, we're interested in events, uh, extreme events of, of drought and floods. We're also cognizant that, that chronic uh, uh, stressors uh, contribute to negative outcomes. So chronic overconsumption of water in rural areas. Uh, northern uh, India is, is a prime hotspot for overconsumption of, of water for irrigation. Overconsumption of water in urban areas leading to uh, near day zero events or in the, the case of Chennai, they, they did have day zero. They, they had to um, truck and, and bring in by railway uh, water to that city for a couple of months before the, the monsoons uh, came and relieved them. Um, and of course, we're interested in catastrophic flooding, and we're seeing this all over the place just in the last three years or so. Uh, you know, just a real increase in the rate and, and destructiveness of these flooding events. We, we heard uh, reference to Harvey that, that hit Houston with, with five feet of water, which was, you know, uh, I mean, my jaw was, was close to the floor as, as I saw that event trans transpire. Here we have a picture of Mozambique that was really walloped in 2019 by a catastrophic flooding associated with a hurricane. Um, and it, it, it was so destructive, it, it created an inland ocean, uh, as it was deemed, and, and caused many people to, to lose everything, uh, and even, in some cases, their lives. Uh, we're not just interested in models, but we're, we're interested in, in data that, that help people do their type of work, maybe their modeling. And so, as, as Samantha pointed out, um, our tool has over 80 contextual data sets uh, grouped under various topics, migration, water, infrastructure, energy, the demographics, economics, food, governance, and conflict that users uh, uh, ca can use them to, to explore and learn more about areas of interest, uh, view time series data, download the data to, to perhaps integrate with their own proprietary data sets. Uh, we try to reach stakeholders through quarterly updates, wi which we publish together with uh, updated maps. We try to reach the public through um, an ambitious media outreach strategy. And then, of course, we have local tools. So, so when we decide we want to uh, operate in a country such, such as Mali or Iraq, uh, Kenya or Ethiopia, uh, we, we don't use the global tools anymore. Um, we have to go to, to more local level analysis to, to look at, at water systems, water supply and demand at, at, at uh, watershed levels. Uh, we look at human responses uh, to, to water related pressures as well and, and we do that kind of modeling. And, and an important result of, of all this is, is we create great uh, visual, data visualizations that audiences uh, in those locations can then use to agree on, you know, th these are the sort of set of circumstances that uh, are causing problems for us. Uh, it, it's a very powerful tool bringing people together and having conversations about um, ultimately how they're going to uh, govern their water resources because it, ultimately it's up to uh, people and their political decisions. Uh, <clears throat> we have a number of uh, satellite-based near real-time data sets on the tool already. Uh, Sam pointed out we have uh, uh, rainfall anomalies, we have evapotranspiration anomalies, vegetation anomalies, but we also are producing some of our own satellite-based near real-time data sets. And one of these is Global Water Watch. And what we're doing with this is for, for 70,000 of the largest reservoirs around the world, we're, we're tracking their surface water uh, extent in near real time. Uh, we can track time series for these. Uh, th this is the reservoir that 
the main reservoir for the city of Cape Town in South Africa. You can see in that box up there in, in the upper right, uh, between 2015 and 2018, uh, a, a three-year drought almost led to day zero and, and to dead pool levels in that reservoir. Uh, we're planning to expand the no number of reservoirs in Global Water Watch uh, to over half a million. Uh, we're, we're planning to go from uh, just looking at surface area extent to trying to estimate the, the volume of water in these reservoirs. Uh, and eventually, we're, we're going to uh, look at some of the major rivers around the world and measure in near real time the, their water discharge rates. Um, and so that, all that's coming. We'll, we'll probably launch, we'll probably have a, a soft launch of Global Water Watch for the UN conference. We'll probably have a full launch uh, uh, by Stockholm World Water Week in, in August. And we are continuing to build and develop. And what we build and develop, really, we, we hope that all of you in the audience here uh, in person and online and in The Hague tell us what you need to do your jobs be because um, we aren't there on the ground in the line of fire, but you are. And you can tell us wh what, what the tools and data are that you need. And so th thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Looking forward to the question and answer session. Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate it. So I'd like to turn now to Roger Pulwardi, and Good let me work. just say first, Roger, congratulations on the Presidential Rank Award. For those of you who don't know, that's a really big deal. Um, so. Thanks, and sir. just my one other gratuitous comment. It, you know, people have been working on these things for decades, and, and sometimes we don't see it, and especially with the political give and take, we don't always see it, but someone like Roger, the reason that we have the ability as a country and as a government to govern on these issues is because we have someone of talent like Roger there all the time working on this. So thank you That's for very nice today. of you. A little overstated, but very nice. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah, I, I like to, uh, you know, sometimes when you say you've been working on this a long time, the corollary is, well, why isn't it better? <laughs> anyway, but the... Uh, <laughs> that's, so much worse no, it could be worse, right? Okay, that's, that's yeah, as a friend of mine working in disasters in Haiti always said, never say it can't get worse. <laughs> so the, as we think through this, I want to bring back, uh, there's a really rich setting on the governance issues, um, certainly, and then from the standpoint of the role of information and knowledge and the improvements. So context matters, of course, a multi-method approach matters. And um, uh, a mentor of mine, um, who's gone now by the name of Gilbert White, used to always ask me the question, if we know so much, why aren't we doing better? And he has a quote on the FDR memorial about living with risk that he wrote for FDR after the floods on the Mississippi. He also did something extremely important that we take for granted. In the 1960s, he asked a fundamental question about aid in developing countries. Who carries the water? Stuff that we take for granted now on the role agenda, started with that by asking who carries the water. So as we think through this and we think through where our certainties are, you know, as I like to say, um, a, a, a tribal person that I work with always likes to remind me that uncertainty is not what you don't know, it's what you know that isn't so. And that's the bottom part of that. <laughs> um, what we've come to learn and think is true. So as we think through this, I'm going to talk about the UN efforts and where we are in this and the role of a the science across no one elsewhere, and I appreciate um, you know, Dr. Spinrad being able to come and say that, but I have a lot of people to blame, and that's that line on, on the end there, and there's a nice image there. This is the year that we saw most droughts across the world in 50 years. But then there's flooding too, right? So let's think through what that means. Change is ahead, and you don't need to be the Dalai Lama to know that change is ahead. Um, so there's a figure we drew in that report 10 years ago, called the IPCC Special Report on Extremes, one of the most widely used reports. From calculated to perceived risk, we're in a stage of complex compounding and cascading risk. And we know this in the room. What do we do about it? The old style of taking event by event isn't working. As I like to tell my friends in hydrology, stationarity was never dead. It was just the statistics you were using for planning that you assumed stationarity. It's the best thing since rediscovering unsliced bread. 
Every climate scientist knows that stationarity was not dead. So cascading and compounding risks, local imbalances, and globally and, and regional network disruptions are overwhelming traditional approaches. This is in the Global Assessment Report of 2019 that we did, the Global Assessment Report in 2022. But it tells us something else, which is local is not enough. It tells us that the disruptions in food security and water security have a global network to them. Right? Where are they imported from? How much is everybody was just in you know, COP27, right? Egypt gets 97% of its imports on food from virtual water imported from somewhere else. There's a lot of that historical account that we need to think about when we're actually dealing with risk. So there's a set of reports there, and, and we can think about where, what this means in the context. This is something I wanted to put up. This is uh, Secretary Gutierrez. Ensure that the worldwide, citizens worldwide are protected by early warning systems against extreme weather and climate change. I co-chair something called the Climate Services Information System for the UN that tries to get us around this. That figure on the top just talks about standard alerting protocol. Something is happening. How do we respond? Something I like to tell folks is Early warning is like taking your car to the mechanic, and she says, I couldn't fix your brakes, so I fixed your horn. <laughs> Doesn't really stop the car. And so as we think through this, we ask, what is being fu funded and spread? Now, one of the things we're designing through the UN and through our partners that is based on some things that uh, Dr. Spernad talked about, the National Integrated Drought Information System, which is the only legislation we have directly on drought anywhere in the world, a public law behind it, about $3.1 billion is being spent. And this realization actually came from the fact that linking the Sendai Agreement on Disaster Risk Reduction to the Sustainable Development Goals was not actually being done effectively. Anybody who knows, and I've said that in this room before, where the word rivals come from? Rivales, river, right? Rivus. Who comes across the stream from you to live? Who takes the water from you? But yes, it creates partnerships. Aaron Wolf, one of our colleagues, um, you know, Gilbert, all of us talk. When we hit that end, I was just talking to someone about the Apalachicola Ch Chattahoochee Flint River in the southeast. Everybody thinks we're out west. I live in Colorado. It's the Colorado River that's contentious. It's the ACF because they've just hit the limits of their system. So they haven't figured out yet that suing each other for decades doesn't work. So I wanted to point to a couple cases that we have that we've been doing, Sherry, myself, Amanda, Lauren. Cases in the Horn of Africa filled, you know, people in this room and elsewhere, the Caribbean, where I'm from, Southeast Asia, migration in Central America from disasters, the Pacific Conference of Free Associated States, to try to build an evidence base for context. And I'll come back to what that means. And there's the four dimensions of this and the types of questions we get, we try to answer. What are the physical risks? When does foresight really matter? It's great to have foresight, when does it matter? Another thing I like to tell people, let's be proactive, you first. Because that implies some upfront decision, right? It's easy to say, here's your risk, what do you do? But it's quite a different thing to be proactive and in the disasters arena, what we call prospective. Not letting new risks arise. Not simply how do we respond to climate change, but how do we not let the things that led us to climate change arise? That's two different dimensions for investments, right? So, one of the cases that we work on is the Famine Early Warning System Network. I'm really glad that we're seeing all three talks mentioning East Africa because a lot is missing in the world in thinking about food security. Right now in the Horn, I have colleagues working on the ground who are from Kenya and Tanzania and from Ethiopia. We're seeing the vulnerability in food security, certainly in, in the Ukraine. 20 million people are at risk of famine right now as a result of five years of drought and other things. So the Food Security Initiative is an interesting one. The Famine Early Warning System Network. Anybody here uh, among the older folks like me remember Live Aid and Band Aid? Yeah. 1984, right? Not, not the book, the year, yeah. So the thing that actually, here's my water connection, precipitated um, Fuyuznet was actually that event when Ethiopia pretty much collapsed and we estimate 400 to 600,000 people perished. So we started bringing to bear what we know globally about the climate system, about interannual variability, data and information. And then this is a critical thing in anybody who's doing hazards and disasters related work. What is the nature of the event? Not just what is a drought or what is a flood. How is it evolving over time? 
That's the phase classification for food security. In other words, if you have a drought, the drought might matter less because there have been traditional approaches, there have been storage. It's when it intensifies and used up the buffers that you have a catastrophe, right? What do we know a disaster is? The thing that overwhelms our capability to respond. So at that point, it becomes very critical to look at the time frame of the evolution of risk, not simply saying, is this place amenable to drought or floods? So, and it cannot be done without the partners on the ground. There's an, a brilliant, I mean, amazing person by the name of Gideon Gelu, who's Kenyan, and, and Giste Beru from Eritrea, who work with us on making that link seamless looking at the impediments of the flow of information among those three data sources and how it interacts and engages people at the local level in their own communities. So in 2016, there was a major drought in this part of the world, and Ethiopia did not collapse because of the partnerships that were done on the ground with partners. And we knew Al-Shabaab was ready to come into Ethiopia had it collapsed. The place where you saw violence was actually in Somalia, not where the drought was, but where people had migrated to where it was raining. So looking at the dry areas alone doesn't get you. This issue. So robust early warning and decision support services, social safety nets, and conflict did not become a major issue that year. There's a whole lot of other things happening right now. As I mentioned right now, we're in a catastrophic zone, five years of drought. The fall rains were pretty weak. And of course, the dependency on Ukrainian wheat and fertilizer, which we knew was going to happen because it happened during the 2010 drought, exactly these parts of the world. So there are analogs for thinking about globally networked risks. Whenever we say, look, it's these poor folks who are suffering, ask the extent to which we take resources from those people that undermine the buffers that they rely on. It's not whether or not you're facing an impact of an event, it's whether or not the things you rely on, your water, land use, changing of, of uh, forest to pasture land, to export soybeans, ask whether or not those are the things. And I'm raising this right now because that's what's being discussed at the CD CBD. That is exactly the issue. The link between Sendai, SDGs, UNFCCC, and the depletion of our ecosystems that support people's ability to respond in the long term. So here's another issue. I'm from the Caribbean. I like to always show some from the Caribbean. We worked a whole lot on the, you know, the Hurricane Maria and Irma. This group, the regional consortium developed by the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology and the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Authority, is one of the first in the world to treat climate as a cross time scale phenomena. Not just what's the projection and how do you respond, but what the extremes, interannual variability on El Nino, decadal, and the long term mean. Because when we respond to emergency events, we can constrain or enable long-term risk. We can actually make it worse depending on the decisions we make or make it better. And this group has actually can show traceable accounts of basically bad drought in 2010, 2013 to 2016. Actually, the risks were not as bad. The number of lives saves during 2017 and 2020. But it's not working at the scale that we need. But that's exactly the types of partnerships that actually make things happen on the ground versus just saying, OK, how do I meet the needs of a user? Right? So this is actually a very, very innovative group. The consortium has become the key regional mechanism. And we saw it, in effect, after an earthquake. One of the things I mentioned was the multi-hazard early warning system when floods were about to happen in Haiti and relief was able to come in. And then a really interesting thing when Soufriere blew up in St. Vincent, and the one of the major damages was on the photovoltaic cells that were used for desal in Barbados. So local matters, yes, but regional and territorial matters as well, because risk is spread in a globally connected world. And that issue actually played a major role in this issue in, in water supply questions, because the water infrastructure was damaged. So, the roundtable on financing we did over the last couple of years with OECD, with the IDB, and others basically showed that the return on investment on early warning system looks small. The return on investment in water security is very large. But what we're trying to do is show that the early warning systems matter to that return on water infrastructure because of the damage that can happen if we think about early warning systems as not just emergency response, but the design of infrastructure over time, the alignment of key reduction. We estimated it's 10 times the value 
that is being es estimated at the moment. So to be, just to wrap up, and, and as I like to say during these talks, I like to say that because then the moderator gets encouraged and is happy, but uh, I'm not right. Anyway, we're not navigating for a changed climate. We're navigating through a changing climate. Very different from saying, I know the truck is coming, from saying, there are many trucks coming. <laughs> so how do we dodge, move, right? Those reports are the state of the climate services that we do with WMO and their member countries on what they've done in early warning and in water. There's a uh, bulletin um, issue we did for the WMO on early warning to early action and multi-hazard early warning systems. So paying attention to structural and systemic risk, the data and science as we're hearing to better characterize a seamless link between multi-hazard early warnings and our civil society, public and private partners, stress testing of dynamic thresholds and systemic risk. The projections for climate change models are important. I'm a recovering climate modeler, but they're in fact don't tell you about what thresholds and true extremes are, so you need both things to do the stress testing. And probably the most critical thing we keep hearing, and Mami Mitsutori, the head of, of UNDR, keeps beating this into my head, is adaptive risk governance. How are we aligning the research, finance, and management across what we call the global risk assessment framework tool? The reducing the systemic risk and realizing the opportunities to minimize investment for future disaster losses in the context of things like water security. The big challenge is not just down to the last mile, like we keep saying, but up from it. And the ongoing challenge is to enable sustainable collaborative <laughs> networks across research, observation, services, and decision making. We have a lot of experiments in trying to do that. It's just not at the scale that we needed to integrate all those pieces of information systems. But there's something even more important, which is even the littlest amongst us know that a little collaboration could get you some water. What's stopping us? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Roger. We're going to go straight into the Q&A, and I just want to remind people who are watching online that you can submit your questions uh, via a box underneath your webcast. So feel free to do that. Um, well, so you are all welcome now who are here with us. If you have questions, to raise your hands, and we'll get the microphone to you so that people online can hear you. And while we're waiting for people to warm up and get ready with their questions, um, you know, one thing I heard all of you mention is governance. Well, let's start. So, so many interesting things that you put on the table. One thing is, so we're entering a time now where the consequences are getting bigger. And therefore, the need for resilience and for getting on the front end of that is bigger as well, because we can't ad infinitum respond. So, um, you know, Roger, you were talking about adaptive risk governance, and that's the whole point of early warning, right, is, is to promote that early action. And I heard all of you saying that. And you also all talked about governance, because at the end of the day, these tools are great, they're wonderful, but if people don't use them and make decisions based on them, then they're inert. Um, I, I mean, can you talk a little bit about um, who's using them or who you hope is using them or how you hope to see them used? And, and Sarah, if you're still with us, I, I'm really curious what you think about what you heard about all these decision support tools. I mean, you talked to us about some really sort of um, huge problems between India and Pakistan on the transboundary trans level, um, glaciers that are, that are causing massive floods, um, and and then the aftermath in Pakistan of that flood and what it means after you've had a flood and the long tail of disaster that puts on a population. Do you think that information is, it can help with all of that? Or do you just listen to this and say the problem is too big to, to really be tackled by bringing better information? I'm curious what you think about that. Absolutely, I'm here with you and happy to speak uh, after Roger. Okay. If there are any questions for Dr. Spinrad, please let me know. He says. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's he's, uh, he's lingering somewhere in the. In in, in the ether. In ether, excellent. <laughs> Good to know. So. Um, Do you want to go on the governance issue? Sure. Well, you, you know, governance is is huge, uh, huge uh, part of risk, and unfortunately, it's mostly absent. You know, if I had to you know, say what, uh, what percentage of governance that we need uh, is actually out there. It, it's, um, 
It's very small. Uh, uh, we, we, we are harming ourselves um, and for, for lack of acting on, on a lot of data that we already have. For, for example, the, uh, the risk of flooding in Florida is going up, and, and you don't need to be a rocket science to see that. But, but what people don't understand, but, but which I, I think a recent Washington Post or New York Times article made clear, a lot of the increasing risk is not the fact that we're seeing more frequent, more disastrous storms. Yes, that's part of it. But, but a lot of the risk is a lot of people are deciding to build condos and other infrastructure in harm's way. I mean, the, the amount, the, the number of people, the, the number of housing in, in South Florida that, that have been built over the past dec couple decades, I don't know, it's, a, it's trebled or, 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 or more. A, a, and those people, and, and I guess I got to include myself b because we still own the condo that, that uh, my <laughs> wife's mother <laughs> left us uh, uh, on a barrier island <laughs> on the Gulf Coast. Uh, and I keep telling my wife, I hope we don't end up holding the bag on this. But um, someone's going to uh, be left holding the bag as they did in, right. in Fort Myers. And, and um, th those are just kind of the easy, low-hanging fruit. OK, w this is something we have to communicate to people, but, but the governance People don't want to hear this. You right. know, the, uh, so where, where are the people, where are the leaders uh, in, in, in trying to protect themselves against harm rather than put themselves in harm's way? And uh, we, we and I, I, I want to come back to you with a methodological question, but Roger, did you want to talk yeah, about governance so, as well? So we, we, you know, the first thing we ever did, did was on hurricanes on the coastal uh, right in the late 90s, showing exactly that you know development in wealth creates the increasing losses that we're seeing, and then people like Ian Burton and they did that since the 1960s. So we've known this for a long time. the The issue is one that for many of those places, they actually then develop service economies for people who have no choice about where to live. And so there's an equity issue from the standpoint of how we put people into places of risk because the majority of people living in those places who are impacted are actually service economy folks who are there to serve the people who can have the second condo. And so, you know, if you lose one, you still have one. If you lose everything you have, that's quite a different thing. And one of the things we've tried to do is get um, in the Caribbean, the Caribbean Catastrophic Risk Insurance Facility, to be able to provide funding to help people restart their lives. Now, one of the things we do have to be careful about, and this has been you know, in, in a set of reports with the Stockholm Plus 50 and so on, is a question of governance. In the question, and the question is, the retreat from the trust in democratic institutions is actually undermining our capabilities to create collective action solutions, retreating from the coast, things like that. And that's a big issue of governance. Now, I don't want to throw our hands up and say, oh, well, then how are we going to fix that through water, right? Well, there is something, which is the entry points and the nodes for collaboration are not about fixing the entire system. We, we don't manage systems. We manage our interactions with them. And so from that standpoint, one of the things we do is we talk about decentralized capabilities at the local level, but we don't fund decentralized capabilities. And that's a governance question as well. Now, there's a trade-off. Authority cannot be all local. Otherwise, the mayor is the, you know, the, mayor, the, the sheriff's brother-in-law again, right? So the idea is how we map onto political coherence, the authority, the accountability, and then how we support local capabilities but still have partners at the regional and national level that, that provide the, the uh, accountability. And I know and that's the government's there's, question. And there's been some really important shifts. For example, FEMA now, uh, f you know, funding resilience, not just the response. And Absolutely. So I think, you know, change is possible here from all levels yeah. of and, governance. And to your point, I mean, we still average only 10% of any funds related to a disaster, and it's even uh, less than that in the case of water, a priori for risk reduction. It's still only about 10%. So, so it's something that needs to change. Um, Sarah, did you have a comment you wanted to add? Absolutely, I was waiting. Um, right, so I think uh, tools like these will really help with countries like Pakistan, where uh, water is a provincial subject. Um, and, what and what tends to happen is that when there's mismanagement of water, 
uh, the provinces will blame the federal capital, the federal capital will blame the provinces, then the provinces will blame local governments. And somewhere along the way, there is loss of information and there's delegation of responsibility. But and, and generally, people will just turn around and say, you know what, we couldn't do anything. We didn't have information. We didn't have data. We didn't have early warning systems. We weren't, we didn't know some, this was going to happen. We didn't know what is going to be scarce on, you know, uh, in this region. So I think tools like these um, will really help sort of provide ready access to government institutions, uh, government institutions that are reliant on other regulatory authorities for um, uh, data. Also, I feel like policies are useless without data. And so if we have access to tools like these, then our policies can be strengthened. And um, especially policies that are being developed by development organizations like the UN or the World Bank, which is generally the case for uh, Pakistan. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to say that these that tools like these will help raise a lot of awareness in the country and, and dispel misconceptions about a lot of things, including water, which is so politicized. Um, so I, I hope that it will benefit all of us here. I hope so, too. And and I'll say... Um... Liz Sakosha and Peter Karens, who I see is here, and I, um, early in the development of this tool, actually went out to one of the places at high risk to ask people about how they would use it. And it was very consistent with what you just said, that one of their problems was very hard to get attention from decision makers and from funders, and that, that this would help them not only understand the bigger picture, but also point to it. So that's great to hear. I want to ask you a methodological problem uh, question, Charlie. So Samantha showed us a whole bunch of variables and um, talked about causal relationships. And you know, in, in, in the scholarly field, there's a lot of debate about whether there are causal relationships here. And I think Samantha made a, a good flowchart that showed it's not direct. It's not like there's no water, now there's a war, um, that there's a lot of intermediaries. But are you saying with, with this model that you know, water causes war or water causes peace? Like, how did you decide which variables to include and which ones not to include? And you know, how did you find those relationships significant enough to put them in your model? Um, well, well I, I think we started with, with, with some of the variables that uh, we were finding useful in the predictive uh, models. Uh, so, so for example, the, the m model we released in 2019, uh, we used, uh, I guess, 15 or 20 variables. And so we knew that, that these, um, well, that, that were, there were a number of factors that could help predict conflict. Um, some were demographic, some were political, some economic, some were related to natural resources, so uh, water scarcity or um, food scarcity or those types of things. So I think we started out knowing that, well, if, if there's a predictive power of these variables, th there may very well be an actual causal relationship. So then some, some very smart people with PhDs in The Hague um, helped us develop the, the new predictive model and the causal model. And, and it was a causal model that wasn't based on traditional statistical approaches. It, it was based on uh, machine learning algorithms. And it is very interesting. Uh, it, it's way above my knowledge level to explain, you know, how, how it works. But, but yeah, we, um, we did the machine learning-based models that, uh, that could help us explain causation, because usually they only, uh, you know, show correlation. So these are new, new statistical, sorry, new computational approaches uh, that, that have only become available as, you know, the capabilities of, 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 uh, of computers ha have increased to a certain level as, as the availability of big data have become available. Mm -hmm. so. And you mentioned you did, you had that, the reason that in case anyone was wondering why we had a very senior Dutch diplomat on is because you've had uh, IHE Delft and Deltares and other partners um, helping with some of that as well, correct? Yes, and, and uh, I can't leave out the, the Hague Center for Strategic Studies. They, they've been instrumental, but, but yeah, we, we've become a family. Uh, um, we, we work seamlessly 
Well, not not without our problems, but uh, <laughs> like any family. Any family, right. <laughs> any family has problems, but we've become a family since 2017. We work very collaboratively uh, and had a lot of give and take and, and with a lot of great support from the Dutch government. Uh, and, and, and Kitty personally has, has, you know, she was the person who helped uh, provide the impetus for this project. So, I mean, thank you, Kitty, if you're still out there <laughs> listening. Roger, yeah, yeah. Sure. So, no, thanks. No, so we're also using quite a bit. This is quite encouraging to see, you know, the role of AI and machine learning and how we, we pull together, um, how we understand the issue of rapid transitions and thresholds. Um, when we look at things like migration, of course, and, and we did that actually right here in on Central America, there are the conditioning factors of the kind that we're leading. From a causative standpoint, the triggering of migration is highly contextual. And so we want to be able to ask the question in taking tools like these and other, um, you know, to me, if something is causative, there's a deterministic function as opposed to a spread <laughs> of, of ideas, right? So I think there's a rich set of um, data and information here in terms of how we think through the likelihood of events happening. But a part of governance is acceptability of what is being presented. So when we talk about working with local communities and with leaders uh, at different levels on how things might be used, one, it's not simply a knowledge deficit as in if we knew more we would do better, that's the barrier, but there's also the other part of it which is, is this acceptable to use in this context? Is it accepted by others? not just the person using it, because that's the thing that gives legitimacy to whether or not we say this, this model is telling us X or Y. Otherwise, it's just another piece of information. So I want to make sure that we're not um, the partners, the people that I mentioned on the ground in, in Kenya and also in the Caribbean, they're the ones who actually help determine the context and the acceptability in which things are applied. One of the biggest barriers we have in communicating knowledge and uncertainty is not simply communicating it, but understanding whether or not the mechanisms we're using to do that is actually accepted. So I do want to keep that in mind, mm -hmm. that if we're about use, and, and, and you know we're about use, but we're actually about making better decisions, not just use, then we have to ask, from a governance standpoint, what, who, at different scales, help us legitimize the tools, the responses, and so on, to get to your point about how would this be used for you, for whose benefit? Because as I like to, uh, Dr. Spinrad and I always like to, to, to quote some guy named Paul Wardy that says, we shouldn't be in the business of helping people do the wrong thing more precisely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there's a big downside <laughs> risk of bad decisions that, you know, for sure. And even that misinterpreting data can and, be used to justify right, to a justify bad decision. Right, to justify an already yeah. preconceived notion of what ought to be done. And so from my standpoint, I think this is an extremely rich approach. We're seeing very similar things on how we're trying to improve um, understanding how extremes are actually constructed. But I do want to get at, to your question, which I think is the fundamental one, so what? Okay. Is really, without that notion of acceptability, without the what confers accountability and so on, the governance structure for information. It's, and, and like I said, you know, I don't want us to, to, we always toss out the word governance these days, and it's not about everything. It's about whether or not the impediments to the flow of information are being overcome. That's one aspect of governance. So I would like to tell people when they say, okay, if we have inner cities, how do you solve the problem? How about one teacher for every 20 students? Let's start there. <laughs> it doesn't have to solve everything. So it's where yeah. the nodes um, and, and I think helped. that's a real challenge with building yeah. tools like this because, you know, when you go through that sorting process yeah. to find out which variables are most important in helping you understand, it's not always what you think. Nope. And it might be things like class size and it might be maternal health. I've and, learned you know. it's never what I think. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was, I was going to say uh, Ro Roger makes a, a crucial point about legitimacy and the governance of information. If, if the information we're providing isn't seen as legitimate, it's not going to be used. So I'll give you a few examples, a couple examples. So, so we went to China with, with our aqueduct maps. This was years ago. A and we, you know, I, I, part of my job is also overseeing the aqueduct program. Uh, they said, this is great, but this isn't our data. Right. You know, we're, we're going to redo your maps, but we're going to use Chinese water demand data. They, they were okay with our, our hydrological models on water supply. 
We went to Ethiopia, same thing. Oh, this is great. It's really fascinating, but this isn't our data. Uh, we're going to use Ethiopian government data. Okay, th that's, that's what had to be done to make this legitimate. Right. And then when you go down to the local level, the, this picture I, I painted of having the local communities impacted provide input to these models. You know, maybe not. Maybe they're not hydro hydrologists, but they, they can provide input on what they know and um, what they know about human responses as well. A and we, we work with that and include that in our local modeling, and that gives the data legitimacy at that level, you know, uh, at the village level. So it's an important value. I know, Lauren, you said you have, we have a, a question, a live question, and then uh, some online questions too. Please go ahead, sir. If you wouldn't mind identifying yourself too. Sure. Thank you. you very much, Chair. Uh, my name is Sid Thurston. I'm with NOAA's Global Ocean Observing Program, and I also serve the World Meteorological Organization as Vice Chair for the Earth System Observations Program. Uh, this is just an excellent discussion. Congratulations, everybody. My question is, uh, last week at COP27, the WMO, World Meteorological Organization, launched its five-year multi-hazard early warning system, whereby within five years, no one on the planet uh, would be caught off guard by an extreme event. And I'd like to just put that to this uh, outstanding panel. If you could please address the interplay of, uh, of the uh, WPS, the Global Early Warning Tool in this new WMO initiative. Thank you very much. Charlie? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, so, so yes, uh, early warning for everyone. Um, we, we've been talking about it for a few months since WMO ca came out with the, that, that goal. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I think it's definitely possible on the data side to, to do that. Uh, the, the main question is, so what? So, so everybody will have early warning. Will they act on, on that information? So um, I don't know exactly how to, how to answer your, your question about how, how that would interplay with WPS. We, we haven't thought that through yet. But, but yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's something that's going to be needed. Uh, early warning for everyone, but but the main question is, what will everyone do with that information? Roger, yeah, yeah. sure. So so I don't know if you came in um, a little late. Uh, I showed the figure of how much was being spent on, um, you know, early warning systems for all, as as we say. It's really filling in a gap in many of the countries that I showed on the map. From the standpoint of early warning, what's interesting about this particular effort, and we were engaged in the launch when that happened in actually in March um, by the S Secretary General of the WMO and the head of UNDR, Mami Mitsutori, uh, was really, to get to your point, sir, was really about how early warning that is people-centered can actually help create legitimacy for actions mm -hmm. that are, in fact, long-term investments in resilience. That's a little different from saying, look, this is about getting people out of the way of risk and then moving them back into places of risk, which is usually how, how we manage in an early warning setting. So it, they, it really is what we're calling an early warning information system where the information is across time scale. The context are completely based on what produces con, uh, acceptability and, and um, legitimacy in a particular role. But ledge is much more serious than whether or not is it produced credibly. It is whether or not the law asks you to do it. And so in that context, what's being advanced on the multi-hazard early warning system for all is one, to try to get at how hazards interact to produce nonlinear risks. Mm -hmm. That's one. And two, to be able to inform the development and siting of resilient infrastructure over time. Where should it go and why? And that's a bit different from the traditional notion of early warning as something that gets you out, out of the way. That continuity between disaster risk reduction and, and climate adaptation, but even more than that, is about resilience, is actually the goal behind the effort. Now, is it scaled up? Is there enough funding behind it? Is that, but the goal is actually fairly new in the context of thinking about the role of early warning 
as something that bridges a risk to resilience continuum as opposed to just a risk. And uh, I, th I think um, we've got yeah. uh, multiple questions. So you tell me, Lauren, how you'd like to handle it. But Thanks. And also, Sarah, I know you're there. So if you, if you have uh, comments, too. Oh, by the way, I didn't ask Sid to ask that question from Noah. OK. Why don't you take a couple more in the room? OK. Sir, right in the center. Thank you. My name is Damoz. Uh, I'm originally from Ethiopia, so it's very exciting <laughs> because I was born and grown up yeah, yeah, yeah. in the Blue Nile River. <laughs> so it's very what's going on in Ethiopia is very, uh, very concerning. Of yeah. course, and it's really uh, very uh, frustrating. Especially, it's a mess. Especially when it comes to uh, water between the conflict uh, tensions between Ethiopia and Egypt, even in what's going on in Ethiopia. Yeah. So it's very, very, very uh, good. So this tool, I really tell you that it's going to fill a huge gap <laughs> as long as we engage politicians. Because in countries like Ethiopia, water is highly politicized. I used to teach in Ethiopia in a university and I went to school to Costa Rica to uh, get my master's degree in environment and development peace. And I went back to work in Ethiopia. But there is less room yeah. to give, to provide, like, you know, constructive critics. Because all the narratives about water security in Ethiopia is like defined by, oh, okay, Ethiopia is poor because it's not using its water resources. Well, part of it makes sense. But it's leading us to unilateral water resource development, which is not going to be helpful. We are blaming Egypt because, OK, Egypt is using the water resources like unilaterally. OK, we are repeating the same thing. But you can't speak like this in Ethiopia. <laughs> right. Because you will be considered as something who is opposing yeah. the development of his own country. No. I argue that Ethiopia has the right to use its water resources. But we have to work together. Right. Yeah. So this tool is going to help the local communities to address their issues, their problems, their, their tensions. But we, ha we still have to also develop tools that you know, predict cooperation and peace building. Oh, yeah. Because most of the researchers tend to emphasize on the conflict generating capacity of climate change. Of course, there is a linkage. Right. But it is based on like very little empirical evidence. Agreed. We still need to develop very strong methodology. Mm -hmm. How, why, and when climate change might trigger conflict or conflict. Because it's going to like cover up like other issues, underlying issues. So anyways, thank you very much. I have a thank lot to say, that but maybe yeah, no doubt. we'll no have doubt. informal discussion with No, yeah. thank you. That's yeah, a really helpful you. comment. And um, I think I, I want to... Um, I'm very emotional, sorry. No, no, it's no, perfect. It's and I, I actually want to um, I want to take uh, several questions and then we'll bank them. And, and Sarah, just something for you uh, uh, to uh, take on board. That, that last comment we just got, I'm curious if you see the same thing in Pakistan that, you know, the same political element, and are you optimistic? You know, you've, you've described all the ways that water is, is a, a problem and is a, an insecurity provider, but are you optimistic that we can also get to the flip side where water becomes a tool for cooperation and for governance? But let's bank a couple of questions. Think about that, Sarah. It would be great to get that comment from you. Um, so if you could, um, we're almost out of time. So if you could ask your questions quickly, and then we'll, we'll do a, a, a closing um, comment on that. In the back, well, Amanda, you choose who you're going to go to. And Lauren, you also have a couple online questions. Okay. Oh, no, don't give him the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Charlie. Hey. <laughs> hey, good good morning. John Oldfield here with the Swiss good. Water and Sanitation Consortium. Yeah. Decision support tools are only decision supports tools if decisions are made. So that's what right. my question is about. You know, and, and Charlie, you, you said unprecedented is the word de jour. So 
we have an unprecedented opportunity or we have a White House action plan on global water security. Yes. We have this new tool. We have the global water Which you're strategy. about to hear about. <laughs> oh, good. Perfect. And we have the SWAT launch, the satellite launch next week. Right. So the question is, what more can we do? What more can the U.S. government do to make better decisions? Getting back to something that Sharon said, better decisions faster and fund those decisions to make sure that the rubber really does hit the road out there. Droughts will happen. Famines are optional. You know, health related uh, waterborne health uh, challenges are actually, for the most part, optional. The challenge is, where do we go from here to deploy these tools? I'll stop there. Thank you. We are we are we out of time? Okay, we get five more minutes. Um, I have one comment. So. I have okay. Oh my gosh! Okay, <laughs> can you? Okay, I, I have ten comments with five parts. We had two people there in the middle that have had their hands up for a while, and and then. Lauren, if you can like kind of give us a potpourri of questions, we can. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Andrea Wolf. I'm the U.S. Uh, Director of External Affairs for Innovation Africa, uh, an NGO that brings uh, clean water through solar technologies to remote villages across 10 African countries. Um, I have two questions. I know we're short on time. One is I'd love to know of an example where you feel that good governance has actually resulted in um, the benefits of these risk-reducing strategies that conflict has been avoided or quelled because of good governance. I would love to use that idea as maybe a template for, for future opportunities. Um, and the second is I'd love perspectives on how the private sector, corporate partnerships um, can propel these fabulous risk-reducing strategies and also these models forward uh, in a way that might be differently effective than governments and NGOs. Great. Thank you. And then the gentleman behind you there. Many thanks. Uh, Sam Sellers uh, from USAID. Um, question for uh, Roger. Um, <laughs> yes, you. Um, <laughs> you. You talked about, uh, you know, if, if we know so much, why are, why are we not doing more? And uh, the, the how information gets legitimized and, and the, the challenges behind that. Uh, Dr. Spinrad talked about a lot of the, the science, mm -hmm. but he didn't s talk as much about building scientific literacy. There's lots of folks out there who think that, you know, if a 100-year flood event happened two years ago, they're good for the next 98 years. <laughs> and we know that's not the case. Roger, you noted in places like South Florida, there are a lot of folks who know they're in harm's way. Uh, but they don't have the resources to make better decisions. How do we couple better literacy with the resources and tools so people can actually act on that information and make risk-reducing decisions? Thank you. Great. Question. Lauren, you want to throw a couple of the online yeah. questions out? So that's a hard one. So can we keep going until we run out of time? <laughs> <laughs> <That's> There's a <laughs> sort of a fire hose of questions, so I'm going to try and condense them and just take what you can. But I think it's helpful to also hear the questions that people are asking online, um, as, especially since this is a series. So we have an opportunity to build them into future events. Great. Um, uh, from Peter Glick to Sarah Hyatt, first uh, condolences Hi, on the Hi. terrible flooding Pakistan has recently suffered. Go, um, he asks, what efforts are being made to address the unsustainable groundwater overdraft in the agricultural sector, if you can comment on that? Um, and then he also asked for the full panel, what international mechanisms can be applied to address more international violence against water systems, as we're seeing now in Ukraine, where water is a weapon and a casualty of conflict? And I think that that is a really good question and one that we will be addressing in this series with people like Erica Weindahl and others. And um, maybe with <coughs> Peter Glick. And Peter Glick, of course. I, Peter. We'll be in touch. Um, Tadesse Kababu, the existing schemes relating to climate finance are primarily risk averse and often not reaching the most vulnerable communities residing in conflict affected and highly fragile states. What can be done to address such a gap? So thinking about climate finance. Um, uh, I'm going to two more. Uh, Joseph Savage is a surface water rule administrator for the U.S. state of New Mexico. Two questions. How much does disinformation inhibit the response to the world water crisis? Mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and then a more rhetorical question. How do we get people and governments to think more long term when they are at the survival level in the short term? And this relates to a question from Colin Hendricks, who's a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, I've worked there like a million years ago. <laughs> 
That's great. Uh, social science research suge- suggests voters reward response to natural disasters much more than prevention. Yeah. And he cites a specific piece issue. by uh, Mahotra and Healy in APSR 2009, in case anybody wants to look that up. How do we align the incentives of politicians to encourage more spending on prevention and resilience? Uh, I mean, uh, there's there's a couple of specific <laughs> questions t- for WPS, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to share them here, but I think we can p- add them the answers to the website, to the event page, so that people yeah. can come back. Um, so Kaylee Ober, a senior program officer at USIP, congratulations on the new job, Kaylee, is uh, the, the WPS tool covers a lot of ground. Where can we learn more about the data used for the indicators and the assumptions made, and where and how does the capacity to adapt feature in the tool's indicators? Um, and tell Tom Delianis from Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada, did you peer review your causal model, both the general model and the regional models? No, but we tried to do it. <laughs> A for effort. Uh, when will the WPS causal model technical note be released? Maybe, I don't know if you have an answer. Soon. Yet. Okay. <laughs> so that that's a lot of questions. I'm going to ask, we are wow. definitely over time. So if we could take... One minute each. Yeah, if you could, if everybody give a one minute closing response. Um, Sarah, do you want to start or do you want us to come to you last? No, I'm happy to start. I just, um, uh, I, I just want to say that with on the agricultural side uh, to reduce groundwater depletion, because that's what I understood. I think my uh, internet was lagging. We are trying to uh, develop a pro- appropriate regulatory framework for surface and groundwater management and uh, uh, devise appropriate crop zoning and cropping patterns, because the idea is to now uh, not um, invest in or rather grow crops that are wasting a lot of water and that are less uh, water intensive like rice. Um, Other than that, we want to minimize water wastage at various levels and increase water productivity per uh, crop yield. Um, But also I do want to comment on the early warning systems uh, question that was raised. And and if I understood it correctly, I just want to add that early warning systems in countries like mine are only effective if they're localized and um, culturally uh, localized to the region. And especially when it comes to women, because um, at at a grassroots level for early, for uh, early warning systems to be effective, women tend to be marginalized. Um, If the early warning information is being transmitted through a cell phone, the man in the family will have it, the woman won't have it. Um, uh, Or if it's being transmitted through, uh, let's say, a TV and and the rural population is only watching the TV in at a um, at a shop or in, in, in the marketplace, women don't tend to be there. So I, I do want to say that early warning systems are only as effective as um, as they are good for women who are also, of course, part of the uh, population. And especially in my part of the world where uh, women tend to be marginalized and policies and, and uh, you know, and tools like these um, also don't get to them. That's all. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you. Roger, you look ready. Oh, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> I'm climate ready. Anyway, <laughs> so um, I, w- I wanted, since Peter is on the phone, I think the comment relative to, uh, from Ethiopia is a really insightful one. Um, the notion that we have to squeeze every last drop in order for development is actually, as you know, and in the U.S., of course, since 1975, we've leveled off in the total amount of water used, but you can't see a blip in the GDP. So we have this myth still that is a pretty dated one of we have to extract every bit of stuff up front in order to maximize economic output. And actually, that's not borne out in practice, even in energy, much less for water, which Peter knows a whole lot about. So I I wanted to make that point. The the, uh, part of the awareness is that using that last drop and not letting it go to the environment is not necessarily equal with economic development. That's um, one. And who benefits from that, right? People create risks, and we're not. Um, to, to that point, um, it would be an interesting idea for us to look at you know, the changing nature of, um, of where surface to groundwater lines are. I was just with the governor of Kansas a week ago on their water conference meeting. And of course, we're familiar with the 100th meridian in the US. Good, that's uh, you know, geographic in terms of wet and dry. There's a state and hydrologic units. But then the line is really between surface and groundwater that is, is the hydrologic boundary. And the local area, active management areas in, in Kansas that are being developed is about trying to use less, more efficiently, following some of the Israeli models. But it's not scaled up at the level that we need. So we know a lot of what to do. 
the issue is one of scaling. And then just to the last point, I want to be clear that the private sector plays a, a huge role in many things positively, but anybody that says a politician's lifetime is about the next four years, in the private sector you get your money every year if you want to think about short-term <laughs> returns, right? <laughs> That's the economic return time. So let's not confuse ourselves. One of the things we're trying to do is work with the private sector on legitimizing resilience marketplaces that they don't spend their money on, but they benefit from, which is different from saying, put money into this area. Joanne Lena Ruth Bay and I try to get cases from around the world for the last GAR, a global assessment report on where the private sector actually invests in nature-based solutions. None that is not underwritten by the public sector. So the idea is to help make the case that the downstream benefits are what they realize. So uh, uh, a little more nuanced approach we'd like to make on the public sector. And private. Charlie, last comment, and then I'll have a closing comment, and we'll get off the stage and cede oh, wow. the territory. Yeah. Well, th th the violence against water systems in Ukraine, that, that's a crime against humanity. A and to Peter's question, he knows the answer. We, we wrote about it a couple years ago. We have to enforce uh, you know, the, the global laws against uh, violence against civilians. But, but with this crazy war, that's the point, you know. Uh, I mean, sorry to get political, but uh, on Ethiopia, uh, Putin yes. is fair game here, I'm just saying. <laughs> you can... Okay, fair game. Yeah, I mean, they're killing civilians, so it's yeah. fair. Okay, thank you. Um, Ethiopia, um, yes, they, they don't want to work internationally because... They're in the catbird seat. They're, they're at the top of the mountain, right? So they don't want to give up anything. Uh, on the other hand, we are finding the Ethiopian governments at, at both federal level and at base and management level very amenable to us, you know, coming in and, and, and trying to help them with, with data or with uh, water allocation. So uh, within the country, very amenable. Outside the country, no, we, we don't want to talk about it. Um, there's so many other questions. I know, I know. So, and, They're a great question. And I'm glad that Lauren will be continuing the series so that we can engage all these questions. And my last two quick comments is, I think one thread that ran throughout that I want to counter is that we're somehow building on failure with these tools. Right. We are not. We are building on success. If you look at the numbers like from the 20th century, like something like the Great Flood in China, millions of people died. Um, we have gotten so much better at preventing death and at warning people. So we're building on success with these, not, with, uh, not on failure. And secondly, when it comes to the question that Charlie answered from Peter about, about war, this is a reminder, Putin's war is a reminder that there are always going to be wars where everything is a target. And that means the civilian infrastructure and people are dying now of the cold the water, all of that, that means we also have to build our defense that way, as though everything is about security and is a target. So it's not just about weapons and force of arms. It's about resilience and peace and security. And that is what these two gentlemen are working on, is so that we can build our, our uh, security the same way that we have to defend it in a time of war. So thank, thank you all you. for being here today. We have a great final session for you. Excellent. Thank Thanks you, gentlemen, and Sarah, for joining us. Thank you. And questions continue to be raised by leaders at the highest levels uh, during my time at state and now certainly at the National Security Council where we uh, created for the first time a climate and energy directorate that is distinct and separate um, from any of the other policy uh, directorates. It, it used to be part of the International Economics Directorate. But you know, a lot of this is about economics, but a lot of it's not. And so this way we are, you know, much more nimble and able to, to, uh, to work with the, the rest of the teams organizing the, inter the interagency responses to any number of challenges. Um, so for me, the, the way that, that this is uh, manifesting itself um, is, you know, encouraging. It, it, the, the solutions that we're talking about as part of this conference, from the highest levels, people understand their necessities. We're no longer having to defend that these are real issues, that issues uh, that, that, you know, senior defense officials or et cetera should be paying attention to. Uh, in many cases, that fight, at least at the highest levels, is, is over. Right, and you've been part of making climate change, um, water, and security issues sort of top tier since day one. 
um, with the administration, and that uh, was always been the president's um, intent and objective. You also mentioned to me as we were sitting there that you know what what was new and not anticipated coming in day one was the Ukraine war, right? Which has and the weaponization of energy. And in the last discussion, we also heard about the sort of weaponization of water infrastructure uh, and the, and the suffering that's occurred in Ukraine. How is that affecting um, the day-to-day -day work, your day-to-day -day work? I mean, it's taking up a lot of a lot of our attention, no question. But I think it's also just reinforcing again, it's not hypothetical anymore that these issues are really at the center of of, of security risks and security threats. We we know that, and so you know, my team handles uh, the full spectrum of energy issues and uh, environmental and climate issues. And uh, with the conflict in Ukraine and in so many of the crises we're facing right now that are sort of spillover effects of what's happening there, um, we're seeing in real time how energy resources, water resources are weaponized and why the protection of them is something we can't take for granted anywhere. And expanding access to water isn't just sort of a moral and, you know, uh, the right thing to do and an important development issue. Uh, really, I, I, the last panel hit the nail on the head when we talked about um, thinking about how we're, we're protecting these sources, how we're safe, building in resilience in a way that is uh, not just, again, about preserving the access to water, but that is able to really withstand a lot of the geopolitical challenges as well that are, are as we know, uh, likely to get exacerbated by other climate impacts. So, Steph, I, I know you've made it your personal mission to um, climate and water, if you so, educate different parts of either the State Department or the U.S. government uh, as they go about their work in other kind of regional or functional cones. Perhaps for this audience, the water, peace, and security audience, maybe you could share a, a personal story about doing that, maybe in one of the regions that we've talked about this morning, which is Ethiopia, the Horn, the Caribbean, uh, but it could be anywhere that you've had some personal experience where you'd say, you know, connecting some of these dots has is different than what's happened even in your experience in the Obama administration. Yeah, I mean, I think just in general, uh, specifically and in general, specifically, for example, right now we're, we're really focused on planning the African Leaders Summit, which is just in a, in a couple of weeks, and we'll have a, a number of African leaders uh, in town. Um, whether it's that, the Pacific Island Leaders Summit, which was just a couple of years ago, the COP, UNGA, any time the president is engaging with leaders, it's not a question of uh, whether this is on the agenda. These issues are top of mind for, for and they're the number one security uh, risk or, or threat that they're facing in many cases. Um, so I, I do like to connect the dots and help people understand. Sometimes we get into jargon and it gets quite scientific quite quickly. Um, so helping people understand, you know, what it means for a certain community if they don't have, if there are dwindling resources and the governments can't meet the needs of their people and how that spills over, um, you know, those are steps that we like to take them th through uh, certain policy leaders. But a lot of them are starting to get it more and more and because they're hearing about it directly from their counterparts. Um, so, you know, and, and this is something that we're trying to empower uh, in other governments as well. The, there was a conversation about the early warning systems. Um, we're very focused on expanding the early warning for all, heeding that call. We've already announced uh, almost $50 million in, in uh, investments that we're making in parts of the world. But um, one of the speakers mentioned it, that's only useful if the right people have access to the data they need. And it's not the, the scientific experts or the, you know, the water experts or, you know, those people need that information, sure. But really it's local communities, it's families, and it's policymakers who are not used to consuming that kind of information to understand how they, uh, and, and local and regional leaders, to understand what they should be doing with that data um, and how they can better prepare their communities for it. Um, so, you know, we're working quite closely with our regional colleagues, but we're also working closer than ever with our development colleagues and with our trade colleagues and with our economics colleagues to try and make sure that uh, democracy and governance colleagues, you know, focus everybody across the, the government who's looking at different issues. There is a way that we all need to be working together uh, if we're going to get to the place we need to be where uh, communities everywhere, particularly those most vulnerable, are able to actually manage the implications of, of uh, climate change and particularly on water. Well, thank you. And um, speaking of the of the vulnerable communities, there's also the equity issue that's been front and center in our discussion uh, all this morning, and a very compelling point made by 
uh, Sarah from Pakistan about how if the early warning information is not available to women because they're not watching the TV or they don't have the cell phone, then obviously people can't act on it. Yeah. So you're also reaching out. No, absolutely. Yeah. And so, and, and uh, you know, we have now this action plan uh, for, for water. We've had uh, for many years now congressionally mandated water security strategy that we've been putting in place. But we last year or this past year for the first time uh, also released an action plan. And the point of doing that was to make sure that we weren't sort of checking a box and doing the congressionally mandated report, but that we were looking at the full interagency and figuring out how we could be bringing the strengths of every uh, different department and agency to bear in actually executing that strategy and doing so in a way that uh, does take into consideration um, you know, equity and, and participation and local engagement in ways that we know are necessary that have always been a, a priority for the president in, in these uh, this type of planning. Um, but that can get overlooked, you know, when you have the same kind of reports coming out. There are so many of these that are, are just required. Uh, we wanted to make sure we were being quite thoughtful about it. And that's the goal of that action plan and now of the work that we're doing to make sure that the strategy is not just released, but, but executed and implemented. Right. So speaking about that ambitious global waters strategy um, that you and others work very hard and was released earlier this year. Um, what are the U.S. priorities for investment and advancement of this strategy, and what could we expect to see reflected in, nec in next year's president's budget yeah. request? Well, uh, you know, the president has made uh, clear uh, the unprecedented level of of climate-related financing that he is prepared to fight for. Uh, so that's $11 billion overall for climate finance, and $3 billion of that will go to his uh, PREPARE plan, the Emergency Re Adaptation Resilience. It's all in that acronym somewhere. PREPARE is, is uh, it takes about five minutes to say the full title. Um, <laughs> um, but PREPARE is, is the bulk. It's this $3 billion annual budget that we're seeking that we will uh, encompass any number of adaptation issues, including I would expect the bulk of, of those efforts are going to be focused on, on water and on agriculture, et cetera. There was also an action plan released on PREPARE recently, too, looking at the 19 agencies that are all involved. Um, we're working now with, with our uh, budget office and with Congress to make sure that does get fully resourced. It's necessary. It's, it's essential here. And, and that it's coordinated. So we don't just have everybody kind of going off and doing their own thing and being like, we have a water program, we have a water, you know, this has got to be uh, with limited resources that we know, you know, the reality is we will have, even the $3 billion is not enough given, you know, what, what's needed, um, that we're doing it thoughtfully and strategically and that we're looking at, um, you know, not only the, the sort of standard uh, like climate smart agricultural considerations, but also how, how governance plays a role and how, you know, local leaders, what really making sure that the strategies that we're pursuing are driven by the communities that they're affecting and not the other way around, that we're not painting every, every community, every country that's vulnerable with the same brush. Uh, we're trying to learn as much as possible and build in the right metrics to, to gauge our success. But ultimately, we're trying to take a steer from the communities that we're serving on this. Um, so I, that will be the, the primary goal, the focus, the organizing principle, I think, for a lot of our wa water issues um, will, will be this PREPARE plan that the entire interagency, if you, if you work on these issues in government, you're very familiar with, with that effort. Right. And to that extent, the water peace and security tool released today might help inform some of those decisions. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, right. I think, look, that's an important point, too, I, and I want to make sure I underscore this. In crafting the water security action plan, in crafting PREPARE, this is building on the work of you know, research institutions, universities, civil society, activists, people who have been working on these issues for a very long time. Um, so I, in no part do we think in the Biden administration that we've like created this and just done all of the thinking and put it out. We have been working uh, really to, to get the best uh, information we can gather from the entire community that's been focused on this and you know, welcome uh, exchanges like this one and, and conferences like this one um, to, to further refine our thinking. And uh, so that will be a continued part of uh, the execution of all of these strategies is really uh, trying to use every tool at our disposal or a tool that is created or released um, and, and piece of guidance that we can take from the wealth of expertise that's needed because we, we know we need it. Right. And in terms of, you know, you and the administration under the president's leadership has already really shifted the narrative on climate change as being both an essential element of our international security, but also in the U.S., also about jobs and opportunities. 
uh, for this and the next generation. And the other element, I think, of this shifting the narrative that really came out in the conversation this morning, and I know you've been working on, is it's it's uh, in the climate space, it's it's building resilience and adaptation as is an equal part to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and that these predictive tools can help you move not just from the prediction but to the resilience strategies. No, absolutely. And I think that was clear for anybody who was at COP or following the COP. The conversation is, is if any, I mean, this adaptation and resilience, we know where we are at this point. There are plenty of impacts that are, are sort of baked in already. And we need to make sure that bracing for those impacts uh, and helping communities that are already facing those impacts is given as much attention and is as much of a priority and as much creativity is brought to that um, as we're also trying to bring to, to bending the emissions curve and, and making sure that we're limiting warming to the extent that we can. Um, so I, I do think uh, that's another you know, marked change, frankly, from the last time I served in government even, is you know, everybody was very focused on mitigation um, and emissions reduction. Uh, resilience was part of the conversation, certainly, but now it's, it's sort of a central centerpiece, whether, you know, we're leading the conversation or any other country in the world is. This is, this is the focus, um, is making sure that uh, the communities that we're building at home and overseas, that we're working with other, you know, partners to, to strengthen all of our economies and build them for the future, that it's done in a resilient way, and that means a climate resilient way. Well, I think um, we are at time, and I think our conversation has really in many ways summarized what we've been about this morning, that, that uh, water uh, and water insecurity is front and center um, for peace and security worldwide, that it's connected to uh, global and climate issues, but that we have, even though we face this era of unprecedented risks, we also have this unprecedented opportunity um, to build on work that's been underway for some time, but to advance it and get it down to the people who actually are the decision makers, working across scales and across boundaries, um, and that we can move from, um, let's say, from risk to resilience uh, in a smarter way overall. And uh, I want to thank Stephanie very much for taking the time away from the White House. We hope we gave you at least a half an hour break, if not some sustenance with it, uh, from the daily grind there. But thank you very much for all that you're doing. And I want to now, in closing, also just thank um, all of the partners uh, at the wa Water, Peace, and Security effort. Um, you all have done such a great job. I really learned a lot this morning. I want to thank those in the Netherlands um, and in the Dutch for uh, Foreign Ministry who have been such leaders on this for so many years. I've had the privilege of, of working with you in many capacities and learning from you, and that's been so important. Our, um, um, our speakers from Pakistan, uh, very important, learned a lot from you too. And uh, Sharon, you led a great, great panel. That was great. It's always great to have you as a partner. And, and Charlie and your team at WRI, you do great work. Uh, I have to give a special shout out to my colleague and partner, um, Roger Polwarty, uh, because he did, I mean, for the work he's done across a lifetime, the Presidential Rank Award doesn't really even do testament to exact all the work that he's done with so many people across so many scales of decision making, as he likes to say, but he has um, really helped move mountains in his uh, particular way, and I was so pleased that... Um, uh, no administrator, uh, Rick Spinrad, could come over and spend some time with us this morning. That was a very special way to kick off the, d the day. And lastly, just to thank Lauren and Amanda and the Wilson team again. You guys rock, and it's a privilege for me to be part of the team. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. It's such an honor to be with you.